I'm going to be talking with you about what the Bible says about heaven, what you always wanted to know about heaven. Probably the most misunderstood doctrine in the scripture. And unfortunately misunderstood by a lot of God's people. We get caught up in the myths that surround heaven. And so we're going to talk about this. And it seems to me very appropriate because the Bible tells us we're going to spend eternity there. And it wouldn't make sense, would it not, to check out the place where you're going to live forever and ever and find out all you can about it. And there's a lot in the Bible about it. And we're going to talk about all the different aspects of it. Some of you know that over the years that I've been here, I, one of my favorite things has been the collection of epitaphs. I, I don't know how I got started on that, but somebody got me started, and I started collecting them. And, of course, epitaphs are very fitting for a series on heaven because it's written on your tombstone. Here's my all-time favorite. I, I love this one. It goes like this. Here lies the body of old man Pease, buried neath the flowers and trees. But Pease ain't here, just the pod. Pease shelled out and went to God. That's actually on a tombstone someplace up in the Northwest. And it's a very appropriate uh, epitaph because it's very accurate. That's what happens when you die as a Christian. You shell out and you go to God. The pod stays here, right? Well, I shared that back east uh, at a conference, and a lady came up to me after she had heard this, and a bit later she had gone home, and she told me that this little epitaph got her into a lot of trouble. And I could not imagine how this could have gotten her into trouble, but she explained to me that she had not written it down correctly. And when she went to share it with the ladies' missionary group, what came out was, here lies the body of old man Pease, buried neath the flowers and trees, but Pease ain't here, just the shell. <laughs> she said immediately she knew she was in trouble <laughs> and she couldn't finish it out. Well, I have a whole lot of these, and... They're very interesting, and it's, it is amazing what people write or have written on their tombstone. It was Sunday, and in Sunday school, the fifth grade class was convening. The teacher was drilling her class about the gospel and salvation. And uh, she was quizzing them at this particular moment in the class, and she said, if I sold everything I owned and I gave the money to the church, would that get me into heaven? And the whole class responded spontaneously with a big no. Well, she said, if I cleaned my house every day, mowed the yard, planted flowers, made my home beautiful, would that get me into heaven? And once again, you can just see it if you've been around kids. Everybody said no. Well, if I was kind to animals and polite to my friends and if I loved my family, would that get me into heaven? As if programmed, the answer was once again a resounding no. Well, the teacher said, then how can I get to heaven? And a little boy who was new to Sunday school that week shouted out the answer from the back, you have to be dead. <laughs> well, the fact is that's true, isn't it? If Jesus doesn't return to take us to be with him, the only way you can get to heaven is to die. And that means every one of us in this room has a chance to go to heaven because the current death rate is 100%. And unless Christ returns soon, we're all going to die. Worldwide, three people die every second, 180 every minute, nearly 11,000 every hour, and if the Bible is right about what happens to us after death, that means that more than 250,000 people every day go either to heaven or to hell. Here in our country, we seem to have lost interest in all of this. A 2003 Harris poll indicated that 82% of the American people believe in heaven. 63% said they expected to go there after they died. But you can't help but thinking of the old spiritual that says lots of folks talking about heaven ain't going there. If recent trends are any gauge, you may be sitting in a service that's very unusual because you will not hear many sermons preached today about heaven nor about hell. You will not hear about the nature of paradise that is awaiting all of those who put their trust in Christ. Heaven remains a very popular subject in the imaginations of novelists and filmmakers, but it has become a seldom discussed topic among Christian teachers and preachers of all stripes. 
Catholic, mainline Protestant, evangelical, nobody talks about heaven anymore. Among the mainline Protestants, it's thought that speculation about the nature of a personal afterlife is anti-intellectual, belongs to the realm of the sawdust floor evangelist. Some say that too much talk of the next world might distract us from the efforts to relieve suffering in this world. And because the church does not have heaven on its mind, sometimes the church becomes indulgent and self-centered and weak. Sometimes its present comfort consumes its thoughts and heaven is just an afterthought. And one of the reasons why the statistics from the Barna Research Company and even from the Gallup polls tell us that there's hardly any difference in the stands of morals and living styles between Christians and non-Christians, I believe can be laid at the feet of this, uh, this great omission in much of the preaching and teaching today. You see what happens when you forget that God has prepared a place for you in heaven where you will spend eternity and that it is a glorious, wonderful place and it's real and it's not imaginary. When you begin to doubt that or when you begin to push it off your radar screen, the next thing that happens because you have a hunger for that in your heart, you start to try to create it here on this earth. And you will spend every dime and, and, and go to every extreme to try to figure out how you can make your situation on this earth as much like the things you've heard about heaven as you can. Get rid of the pain, get all the toys, live in a beautiful place, come to Southern California, whatever. And all of it sometimes is the result of not understanding that while those things are okay, you could never approximate that which God has in mind for you in the place we call heaven. You can try for the rest of your life you can get consultants to help you. You can do anything you can imagine to try to create heaven on earth, and it's impossible. You know the richest man who ever lived tried it. The wisest man who ever lived tried it, and he discovered that it was all just vanity. God has placed within your heart and within mine a hunger for eternity, a hunger for heaven. And if we do not understand that, and if we do not feed that hunger with the spiritual truth of the Word of God, we will end up suppressing that need and, and replacing it with, with cheap and tawdry things that will leave us empty and without satisfaction. So what's up with heaven? Today I want to just examine some certain things that I think might be sort of foundational for us as we move forward. I'd like to talk with you for a moment about the prominence of heaven. Did you know that heaven's mentioned over 500 times in the Bible? In the Old Testament, the word is shemayim. It's a plural word. It means the heights. In the New Testament, the Greek word is Uranus, and it inspires the name of the planet, Uranus, which is the same name. The word refers to that which is raised up or lofty. So the two words from the Old Testament, Hebrew from the New Testament, Greek, speak of heaven as a place that is high and lofty and lifted up. And that word is found over and over and over in the Bible. You could not have a Bible if you took the word heaven out. It would just be a mishmash. Heaven is prominent in the teaching of the Scripture. It's prominent in a strange way in our postmodern culture. It's just not prominent in our hearts and prominent in our thoughts. But I want to talk with you secondly about the plurality of heaven. Did you know the three heavens? You say, man, I'm trying to figure out one. You tell me there's three when Paul was writing his letter to the Corinthians, his second letter, he mentions an occasion in the 12th chapter when he was caught up, he says, into the third heaven. And then later on he refers to that as being caught up into paradise. So Paul apparently had a premature opportunity to see the third heaven. Now if there's such a place as the third heaven, there must be more than one. There has to be at least three. So let me tell you what the three heavens are. First of all, the first heaven is what we might call the atmospheric heaven. The first heaven is mentioned in Scripture a number of times. For instance, in Isaiah 55, verse 9, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down from heaven, the atmospheric heaven refers to that blanket of air immediately surrounding our earth in which birds and clouds move. Genesis 1.20 says it this way, 
Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. The first heaven is the heaven you see when you walk out into your yard at night and you look up into the sky and you see the, the envelope sort of that surrounds our earth. But then the second heaven is mentioned in the Bible as well. And that is, re is referred to in Genesis chapter 1 verses 14 through 17. Listen to what it says. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. And let them be for the lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater lights to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And he made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. The stellar heavens, the second heaven, refers to the outer space that contains the sun, the moon, the stars, and all of the galaxies other than our own. That's the second heaven. But remember, Paul said he was caught up to the third heaven, and this is where we read that in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 4. This is what Paul writes. He says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, he's referring to himself here, who, whether, who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to a third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, but he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Paul is saying there is something beyond the atmospheric heaven, there is something beyond the stellar heavens, there is a third heaven. And it is in that heaven that God resides. In fact, in the Bible, we are told over and over again that God is in heaven. We are taught to pray, Our Father who art in heaven. In the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 16, we are told that we're to let our light so shine that men might see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Psalm 11, 4 says, The Lord is in his holy temple the Lord's throne is in heaven. Whenever you see that referred to as the place where God is, he's not in the atmospheric heaven. He's not in the stellar heavens, in essence of his residence. He is in the third heaven, the heaven which is the heaven of heavens, where God resides. And it is that heaven to which we aspire. It is that third heaven where we are going someday to be with God and to be with Jesus Christ. Well, you say, that's good, we have three heavens, and now I know that the third heaven is where I'm going, where I'm going someday if I'm a Christian. So let's talk thirdly, not only about the prominence of heaven and the plurality of it, let's talk about the place of heaven. Turn to John 14, would you please? John chapter 14, and I want to read uh, right at the beginning here the first three verses of John 14. I hope you have a Bible. One of the things you find out when you come to shout them out. Let me ask you to do this. Put your finger there and hold your Bible up. Would you do that? Hold, um, I, we got enough Bibles to go to war, don't we? Amen? See, this is a good thing. When you come to a church, do they bring their Bibles? Now, that's not some sort of a spiritual fetish or something, but this is what we study. Amen? If you want to know about heaven, you've got to have a Bible. John chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now let me put this scripture in its context. Jesus had announced to his disciples that he was going to the cross, and he was going to die. He was going to be buried, and he was going to be resurrected, and then ultimately he was going back to heaven. His disciples were filled with sorrow, and their hearts were troubled, they didn't understand this. Put yourself in their place. We have a challenge to understand it sometimes, looking back on it as history. They were experiencing as it happened. And Jesus said, I'm going to go away. And his disciples were filled with anxiety, and they wanted to know where and why and how. And Jesus gave them this truth in John 14. He says, I don't want your hearts to be troubled. Don't be filled with anxiety about this. I want to tell you something. In my Father's house, there are many mansions, and I'm going up there and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare this place, I'm going to come again and get you and take you where I am, that where I am you may be also. They didn't understand it. But we understand it now, don't we? 
we know that Jesus was promising something not just to his disciples but to all of us and I want you to notice what he says he went to heaven to prepare a place a place for us he did not go to change our state of mind he did not go to place us in a in a sort of a spiritual funk so that we would think about good things and that would be our heaven no heaven is referred to in the Bible over and over as a place and there are many metaphors for heaven in the Bible for instance on some occasions heaven is referred to as a country and when we hear that we're reminded of the vastness of its territory sometimes it's referred to as the celestial city when we think of heaven as a city we see uh, in our mind's eye the inhabitants and the marketplace and the commerce sometimes heaven is referred to as a kingdom and when we refer to it as a kingdom we think of the organization and the government and the process but the best definition of heaven in my estimation is right here in John chapter 14 where Jesus said it's my father's house it's my father's house most of us here who grew up in warm and loving families have great memories of the father's house something about it it's like a magnet that draws you back whether you move across the country or even around the world there's something about the father's house that you want to come back to my wife and I used to drive on a weekend over a thousand miles one way to come back to the father's house just to spend a two or three hours there and then turn around and go back you see there's something very intimate and sweet and personal about heaven when you talk about it being the father's house it's no longer an empty space in your mind's eye you see furniture don't you you see decorations on you see the warmth that's a part of a home and Jesus has promised us that if we put our trust in him he has prepared a place for us in heaven that is in his father's house and we are we are privileged to be a part of living there in that place forever and ever please hear me heaven is not as some people say an imaginary place some people say heaven is a benevolent state of mind a reward for being good some say heaven or hell is whatever you make of it in this life a projection of the best in yourself but listen to me men and women heaven is not a figment of imagination it is not a feeling or emotion heaven is not the beautiful isle of somewhere heaven is not merely a thought form it is not a projection of the best in you it is not a vision of a longed for utopia it is not a pleasing hope or the invention of man our thoughts do not make heaven heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people it is a place and the word in the new testament language is the word t-o-p-o-s tapas which is a very strict word in concerning a place that you can locate jesus said i go to prepare a place for you and i believe that there is a literal place called heaven if you ask me exactly where it is I don't know that I can answer that totally with authority but let me tell you what I believe the Bible teaches most of the time when we we talk about heaven we say it's up don't we heaven is up Ephesians 410 says that he who descended is also the one who ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things and when Jesus was ready to go back to heaven in his ascension in Acts chapter 1 verses 10 and 11 we read while they looked steadfastly toward heaven he went up behold two men stood by them in white apparel who also said men of Galilee why do you stand gazing into heaven this same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven so we would have to assume that heaven is up but which way is up if we say it is in the direction at right angles with the earth's surface wherever we may happen to be then it would be in a different direction from every point on the earth <laughs> according to this up would be everywhere in general and nowhere in particular <laughs> it would be different if you were in China than it is if you were in America it would be different if you were in Brazil than it would be in did you ever think about that have I have I really messed you up this morning I mean well let me just try to help you with this if I can where is heaven heaven is up 
But I want you to read with me a passage that gives us a little information on that. In Isaiah chapter 14, has to do with the issue of Satan and his being kicked out of heaven. But notice chapter 14. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. Just underline that last phrase. Referring to the place where he was as heaven. He refers to it in this, in this chapter as the farthest sides of the north. Now, no matter what part of the earth you are on, no matter where you are standing, north will always be up. It would seem reasonable to conclude that heaven is somewhere in the northern heavens beyond the reach of the astronomer's powerful telescope. And scientists tell us there is such a place that seems to be somewhat vacant of stars and galaxies, and it is in the northern heavens, and most scholars who want to particularly place heaven in the third heaven section, say it's in the northern part of the third heaven. Now, when I try to explain that to my wife this week, she said, honey, all the people who come to our church from the south are going to be real mad at you. <laughs> heaven is not in the south, it's in the north. Just going to have to take it by faith. It's what the Bible says, and uh, we'll deal with that whole issue later, all right? So heaven is a place. You know, there's an issue that I need to deal with sometimes. People say, well, heaven is so magnificent. You know, the mind can't conceive of it. The mind can't. No, no, that's not true. In the passage that says that heaven is such a place that we cannot conceive of it, the next verse says, but it has been revealed to us what it is because it's in the Word of God. And it's amazing. It is amazing. And it's so much fun because most people don't know about it. They just don't know. If we understood everything the Bible tells us about heaven, we'd have such a longing to be there. It would, it would occupy our attention and our thought process. Heaven's a place. But I want you to notice, lastly, that heaven's important because of the preciousness of it. Heaven is a precious place. You say, well, Pastor Jeremiah, why is it precious? Because everything that is near and dear to you and to me Everything that's important to a person who's a Christ follower, everything that's meaningful to anyone who says that they love God and they're followers of Christ, everything important to them is in heaven. Everything. First of all, let me tell you, your Redeemer is in heaven. Did you know that? This is what it says in Hebrews 9, For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true, but he has entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Our Redeemer is in heaven. I have a feeling when we get to heaven and we see the golden streets and the gates of pearl and all of those other things which are really true, they're going to fade into insignificance when we see the Savior. When we are able to get our eyes upon the one who paid the penalty for our sin and hung on the cross, when we're able to see the nail prints in his hands and perhaps even the place where the crown of thorns crushed his brow, and put our hand in the side where the spear was. Jesus will appear, I believe, in heaven throughout eternity as the Lamb of God and our Redeemer. And he will carry with him throughout eternity the scars of our redemption. And when we see Jesus, heaven will really be heaven. Everything else will pale in insignificance. One author that I read said, if he could be in heaven and just peek through a keyhole for one second every thousand years and see Jesus, it'd be worth going. And I want to tell you something, it's going to be far better than that. I don't know how it all works, but we're going to be able to fellowship with him personally and know him in a way that's even beyond our knowledge of him now. Our Redeemer is in heaven. And then secondly, our relationships are in heaven, aren't they? If you have loved ones who have died and they're Christians, they're in heaven. You ought to think about heaven just because of that. My father told me, Toward the end of his life, he said, you know, one of the things about getting old that's kind of tough is you have more friends in heaven than you have on earth. <laughs> and he was right about that. Isn't, isn't that true? It kind of is a gradual thing as you get older. You hear about somebody who is a contemporary of yours who's gone to be in heaven. And now here we are, Don and I, and we're the, uh, we're the patriarchs in our family because our parents, all four of them, are gone. They're in heaven. And I care about that. 
and we're going to see our, our family in heaven. I want you to read with me this verse from Hebrews 12 where, where the writer of Hebrews says, To the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. This is a reference to the population of heaven and the fact that our loved ones are there. Our Redeemer will be there, but our loved ones are there too, and we're going to have a chance to interact with them, and surely you will. Interestingly enough, the Ladies' Home Journal ran a poll. I can't believe they did this for me. It's so wonderful. Uh, and the question was, who would you most like to see first in heaven? And here are the results. 31% said mother, 16% said father, and 10% said spouse. <laughs> That's a pretty sad story right there, isn't it? There's something going on there we don't know. I don't know. Maybe it was the way they asked the question. You know, I'm not sure. Well, our Redeemer's in heaven. Our relatives are in heaven. Notice, thirdly, our resources are in heaven. First Peter 1, 3 and 4 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And watch this. To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Hey, man, somebody got happy back there. <laughs> Woo. You know what? When you became a Christian, God was your, became your father. And you know what? When God became your father, he made you an heir. You're an heir of God. And you now have an inheritance. And Peter says that inheritance has gone ahead of you. It's preserved in heaven forever. It cannot ever go away. It's not going to be touched by inflation. It's not going to be hurt by any of up, the ups and downs that we experience economically here. You have an inheritance in heaven that is preserved for you. It's got your name on it. It's your inheritance. Your resources are in heaven. Number four, your residence is in heaven. Now, I'm not just talking here about where you live. I'm talking here about your citizenship. Philippians 3.20 says it this way, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, we are not citizens primarily of this land. Well, when you get your passport and you have to put down, you know, where you were born and your, your place of uh, a residence, you usually put... You know, I was born in Toledo, Ohio, and I live in San Diego County. But my real residence is in heaven. I am an ambassador. I'm on a visa down here. And I, I'm just trying to represent my country best and represent my Savior best. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. <laughs>
looking for a reward. I'll tell you something. God is into rewards. And all through the Bible, God is into motivation and rewards. And if you don't believe that, you haven't read the Scripture. God wants us to be faithful, and He holds out for us a crown that we can aspire to. And one day in heaven, we're going to get our rewards, and our crowns will be given to us. And then we're told that we're going to cast those crowns at the feet of Jesus in an act of worship that will be unlike anything we have ever experienced before. Our rewards are in heaven. And then our riches are in heaven. Matthew 6 says that we're not to lay up for ourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let me just touch on this briefly. The way you send your treasures to heaven, listen to me, the only thing that's going to go from here to there and the only way you can get your treasure from here to there is to invest it in the things that are going there. The only things that are going there from this earth are the souls of men and women and the Word of God. So if I were you and you're, you're trying to build a little equity in heaven, I'd be investing myself, both my personal resources by way of talent and time and treasure, in the eternal souls of men and the eternal Word of God because when you get to heaven, that's the only thing you're going to see that went on before you that's invested there at this present time. Are you headed towards your treasure? I hope you are. Finally, and we're finished, our reservation is in heaven. This is the most important thing. Revelation 21, 27 says this, But there shall by no means enter into heaven anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. The Bible says that in heaven there is a book, a registry. It's called the Lamb's book of life. And the names of all who will be in heaven are recorded in that book. Somebody says, I wonder if it's computerized. I don't know. But it's a book, however you want to say a book. And there's a place in that book for your name and for mine. Jesus said to his disciples on one occasion, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Let me ask you this question. Is your name written in heaven? Do you have a reservation in heaven? Because one day you're going to stand before God, and he's going to say to you, Why should I let you into my heaven? And if you can't say with authority, My name is in the book. I have a reservation. I have put my trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior. And therefore... <laughs>
and very, very exclusive, and she couldn't help but think about how much fun it would be for her and her husband Roy to go to the reception. So the wedding came, and when it was over, they drove down to the towers, and uh, they went to the reception desk, and there was a tuxedo-dressed maitre d' there who was introducing everyone and offering luscious hors d'oeuvres and exotic beverages. As they came to this place, the bride and the groom approached a beautiful glass and brass staircase that led up to the top floor. Someone ceremoniously cut a satin ribbon draped across the bottom of the stairs. They announced the wedding feast was about to begin, and the bride and groom ascended the stairs, followed by all of their guests. At the top of the stairs, the maitre d' with a bound book greeted the guests outside the doors. May I have your name, please, he said. I am Ruth Anna Metzger, and this is my husband, Roy. He searched the M's. I'm not finding it, he said. Would you spell it again? Ruth Anna spelled her name out very slowly. After searching the book, the maitre d' looked up and said, I'm sorry, but your name isn't here. Well, there must be some mistake, Ruth Anna said. I'm the singer. I sang for the wedding. And the gentleman answered, it doesn't matter who you are or what you did or what you did. Without your name in the book, you cannot attend the banquet. He motioned to a waiter and called him over and he said, show these people to the service elevator, please. And they were ushered out of that area of the towers, past beautifully decorated tables that were laden with shrimp and whole smoked salmon, magnificent carved ice sculptures, and adjacent to the banquet area there was an orchestra preparing to perform, all of them dressed in white tuxedos. The waiter led Ruth Anna and Roy to the service elevator, ushered them in, and pushed G for the parking garage. After locating their car and driving out of the area several miles in silence, Roy reached over his hand and put it on Ruth Anna's knee and said, Sweetheart, what happened? Well, she said, when the invitations arrived, I was just jammed up busy. I never bothered to RSVP. And beside, I was the singer. Surely I could go to the reception without returning the RSVP. Ruth Anna started to cry, not only because she had missed the most lavish banquet she had ever been invited to, but also because she suddenly had a small taste of what it will be like someday for people as they stand before Christ and they find their names are not written. in the Lamb's Book of Life. And when she told the story, she said, and then they will be put on an elevator that doesn't stop at the garage. In that same chapter where Jesus said, in my house are many mansions, he tells us how to make the reservation. And I want to tell you something that's the greatest good news I could ever say. Almighty God is still accepting reservations for heaven. Amen. Amen. If you're here today and you've never put your trust in Christ, it's not too late, not too late yet. <laughs> Amen. Do you remember I read to you from John chapter 14 and I said that when Jesus got done telling everybody where he was going, that Thomas, the doubter, remember Thomas always questioned everything. Thomas said, Lord, we don't even know where you're going. How can we get there? In other words, we don't have a... 
one of those things in our car. We don't have a map. We don't know anything. We don't know how to get there. And I don't know if you've ever connected these verses because they're very famous verses. But Jesus spoke to all of the disciples in verse 6, and he said, Thomas, I know you don't know where I'm going, and I know you don't know how to get there, but let me just put your heart at ease. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. My friends, you can listen to the political correctness all you want to. There is only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. It's not about a religion. It's not about a church. It's not about a dogma. It's about a person. Jesus is the way. If you have never put your trust in him, your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life. And if you should die today and seek entrance to heaven, you would be denied. Not because you are good, bad, or indifferent, but for one simple reason. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Those are not my words. That's not Baptist, Baptist doctrine. That's the word of God. God says Jesus is the only way. If you want to go to the Father's house, the only way you can get there is through Jesus. And I want to ask you this morning this question. Have you put your trust in him alone for eternal life? Not asking you if you're a, a good person. Not asking you if, if you're the soloist at the wedding. <laughs> I'm not asking you if you go to church. I'm asking you one question. Has there ever been a time in your life when knowing what you were doing, you asked Jesus Christ to come into your life and be your Savior, to forgive your sin and give you eternal life? Has there ever been a time like that? And if there has, you know... <laughs>
And notice at the top of your Bibles, if you have a Bible like mine, it says, the revelation, what? Of Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation is the apocalypsis. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. So amidst all of these warnings and these visions, the ultimate purpose of the book of Revelation is to unveil for us the glory and power and sovereignty and victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a prophetic book. And then it's a personal book. Verse 2 says, John bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Now look in your Bibles at verse 11 and notice what it says. Christ said to John, what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. And then he lists them. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And if you read the second and third chapters of the book of Revelation, you'll find all those letters, one right after the other, short little letters that were written by John to individual churches. Notice, as you look at the map on the screen, that these places are in a semicircle. So that if you were on the Isle of Patmos, which you see there, and you were John, you could look out over there and visualize these churches, which all were churches that he ministered to, that he was caring for. And so if you were to deliver these letters to those churches, you would start at Ephesus, and then you would travel north to Smyrna and Pergamum, southeast to Thyatira, Sardis and Philadelphia, and finish your journey at Laodicea. John wrote these seven letters given to him by the Lord to these seven actual churches. And though those churches are historic in terms that they took actually were real churches back then, the letters that were written to those churches are very important because they tell us what Jesus thinks about the church. And if you read these letters, in fact, I tell young pastors this, you want to know what's wrong with the church today? Read the seven letters that Jesus wrote to the seven churches in Revelation, and you will discover almost all of the same problems that we have in our churches today. If we would just take note of what Jesus said to those churches, we would save ourselves a lot of trouble and get ourselves out of a lot of messes that we get in because we don't hear the word of the Lord. So it's a prophetic book, and it's a personal one, but here's the one that gets most people. It's a picture book, a pictorial book. In verses 1 and 2, we read, He sent and he signified by his angel to his servant John. I want you to think about that word signified. Take it apart and say it the way you would if you took it apart. He signified. <laughs> what is a sign? It's a symbol. And in the book of Revelation are a lot of symbols. And these symbols are really important. Why are there so many symbols in the book of Revelation? Well, one of the reasons is that symbolism is not weakened by time. In other words, a symbol allows us to apply the lesson today just as it was applied back then because symbols are not affected by time. A beast in the first century is a beast in the last century. And when John writes these words that were given to him by the Lord, the Lord gives him some signs to use. Now, don't be mystified by that because, listen carefully, the book of Revelation is the most self-interpreting book in the Bible. What I mean by that is, if you read something you don't understand, just be patient and keep reading. It will probably tell you in a few verses what it means. The symbols and the signs of the book of Revelation are there so that the message will convey the same thing to us that it conveyed to the people who heard it the first time. And it imparts values and it arouses emotion. There's something about a symbol that explodes in your mind. For instance, that man's a dictator. That's all right. He's a tyrant. That's a little better. He's a beast. Did you know that in the book of Revelation there are two beasts? One that comes out of the sea and one that comes off of the land. They're two incredibly evil people. And the Bible speaks of them as beasts. Because it arouses a different emotion in you when you hear that. For instance, in the book of Revelation, Satan is symbolized. You know how he's symbolized? He's a dragon. Whoa. You can read the book of Revelation and not understand it, but you cannot read it and ignore it. It gets into your head. It gets into your mind, and it makes you want to know, what does this mean? It's a prophetic book, a personal book, a pictorial book. And then here's one of the great things about this book. It's a profitable book. The book of Revelation is the only book in the Bible that I'm aware of that has a blessing associated with it for those who will read it. And it's not in the book of Revelation just once, it's in twice. It's at the beginning of the book, 
And at the end of the book, let me show you the verses. Revelation 1, 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. At the end of the book, in verse 7 of chapter 22, we read it again. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the word of the prophecy of this book. The Bible says that when we study and we learn and we keep the words of the book of Revelation, Almighty God will bless us. And I have watched that over the years. God blesses those who study and understand this book. This book is profitable for personal application. The book of Revelation is not just some prophecies about the future. It's filled with instruction and encouragement for us in the present. When we read this book, it should change the way we live. It should govern our conduct. Revelation puts everything in a perspective. This book is profitable for public assembly. Public reading and exhortation were an integral part of the gatherings of the early church. And then it was profitable for prophetic anticipation. In the third verse of Revelation 1, the verse ends with the phrase, the time is near. Revelation 22.10 says the time is at hand. A lot of people have taken those phrases and said, well, you see, Jesus is coming back, and then they'll get crazy, and they'll actually predict when it's going to happen. The Bible tells us that no man knows when the coming of the Lord will happen. Only the Father in heaven knows that. Not even Jesus had that information while he was on this earth. The angels don't know, and I promise you there's no preacher who knows. We know the time is near. We see the signs that it's approaching, but no one knows the day nor the hour when Jesus comes back. But when the Scripture says his coming is near at hand, or when it says, as we've mentioned, the time is near, all that means is that his coming is the next event on the prophetic calendar, that there's nothing else that has to happen before that, that he has to come, and it's the next major event. So we should anticipate that he's coming and not try to predict when it happens. And then notice as we continue this that the book of Revelation is a practical book. I think this is one of the most exciting things about studying this book. This book is practical. First of all, when you study this, it empowers you to live a productive life. How many of you know that if you know for sure where something's going and how it's going to end, it affects what happens in between? And in Matthew 24, 46, we have this little phrase, Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing, or he will be faithful. And this is at the end of a story where he's talking about a, a, a man going away and leaving his servants in charge and, and believing that his servants are going to represent him faithfully while he's gone. And he says when he comes back, that servant is blessed if his master sh he finds him doing what he's supposed to do. And that's the point of prophecy. When we know he's coming, we want to look after things the way we should if he would intercept our lives before we leave this room. We want to live every day in light of the fact that we believe the Master's coming and we're supposed to be serving Him and living for Him and let, not, let, let Him not find us, you know, goofing off. When you really believe that Jesus is coming back, it is a motivating factor in your life. Studying prophecy empowers us to live positive lives. The book of Revelation promotes a positive mindset. As you study it, you begin to realize that everything that is happening in our world today is heading somewhere. In the book of Revelation, as in no other book, we see God's sovereign hand upon the affairs of the world. We see him in control even though so much here on earth looks like it's totally out of control. And John says that Jesus Christ, verse 5 of chapter 1, is the ruler over the kings of the earth. Now, this is not a statement about the future reign of Christ. It's a statement about his present reign. He is today, this very hour, the ruler over the kings of the earth. Now, I don't know if you've been noticing, but the kings of the earth have been doing some pretty strange things lately. But the Lord God is in charge. He's the king of kings, and he's the Lord of lords. And ladies and gentlemen, one day, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen.
So if you really believe that, if you really believe what I've said, and you believe that's what happens when you study this book, here's a couple things I need to tell you. You don't need to walk around with your head down. I know a lot of Christians are discouraged these days. I talk to them all over the country, and I receive thousands and thousands of emails every month from people telling me about all the kinds of problems you can never even believe. So many of them are are testimonies to God's grace, but many of them are just saying this is what's going on in life. There's a lot of reasons if you want to be discouraged to be discouraged, but you can't be discouraged if you really understand prophecy. Because if you understand prophecy, you realize that whatever you're experiencing right now is just for a short time, and there's something better coming. And that's why you read in the words of Jesus, look up Lift up your head because your redemption is drawing near. It doesn't say look down, bend your shoulders, walk stooped over, discouraged. No, no, it says look up, lift up your head because your redemption is drawing near. Paul, who after teaching us about the coming of Christ at the end... of his passage says, comfort one another with these words. With what words? That Jesus Christ is coming back. And then studying prophecy empowers you to live a pure life. Let me just touch on this quickly. Here's a verse of scripture that teaches that. 1 John 3, 2 and 3. Listen to what it says. When he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. What does that mean? Well, let me put it down on the lower shelf. Is there anything about your life that you would change if you knew you were going to stand before Jesus Christ this afternoon? Well, that's it. When you know Jesus is coming back, it makes you want to live a life that's honoring to him. When he comes back, I want him to find me doing the right things. I don't want to be backslidden when Jesus comes back. I don't want to be walking afar off. I want to be walking in fellowship with him. I want to be living. When I think about the Lord coming back, I don't want to be embarrassed at his coming. I don't want to be ashamed at his coming. The coming of the Lord is a strong motivation to live a righteous life. Just think about that as you have opportunity. And the last thing, this book is a purposeful book. Revelation is a book that's written on purpose. It's written to tell us about two things, the return of the king and the reign of the king. First of all, it says that Jesus Christ is coming back. There's going to be a king on this earth one day. Verse 7 of Revelation 1 says, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. This is just one of many verses that tell us that Jesus... is coming back. Daniel saw it in his prophecy in the Old Testament. He wrote it like this, I was watching in the night visions and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. 
And in his Olivet Discourse, Jesus spoke of his coming in similar terms. He said, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all of the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And John expanded upon Jesus' words, and he said, when he comes, listen to this, every eye will see him, and it's going to happen. The king's coming back. And when he comes back, he's going to set up his kingdom, and he's going to rule. That's what it says. He's going to reign. Verse 8, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who was and is and is to come, the Almighty. He's the first and the last. He's the beginning and the end. He is, and he is who was, and he is who is to come. He is the Almighty. When he comes the second time with his saints, he's going to set up his kingdom on this earth. And for a thousand years, there will be a rule of righteousness on planet earth. And the Bible says if we're followers of his, we will reign with him. We will rule with him on this earth. It's no wonder to me that after John wrote all these things down in this book that was given to him just from the Lord, at the end of the book, do you know what he said? Listen to this. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. I think that's what I would have said. In fact, that's what I say. understand about what God has in view for us as he comes back. My heart says this, even so come, Lord Jesus. How many of you know that it seems like in our current situation, there may not be any other answer. (laughs) Even so come, Lord Jesus. Yet while we wait, we still need the revelation from Jesus that he gave to John. It's a revelation which changes everything. It's a revelation that God is on his throne And he is working out his strategies from the control room of heaven. And one day he is sending his son, Jesus Christ, back to this earth. And he will make all things right. And I praise God that I know that in my heart. And every day when I get up, if I'm tended to get discouraged, it takes me a little while, but I finally get around to the fact that the God I serve has got it all in control. may seem out of control to me, may be out of control to me, but it's not out of control to him. And he loves us, and he's cared for us, and he's provided a way for us to be a part of everything he wants to do going forward. And he tells us that if we put our trust in him and we give him our lives and ask him for forgiveness of our sins, we become a part of his future plan. And one day he's going to come back and immediately take us up to be with him, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. If you don't know that, when you hear about the return of Christ, I hope it puts within your heart a deep motivation to make sure that things are right between you and your maker. It's too late to do that when you die. You don't get to come back and get it right the second time. You've got to make things right during the time that God gives you. If you're not a Christian today, this would be a great time to become one.
In a recent article in the Washington Post, the headline read, the coronavirus pandemic is pushing America into a mental health crisis. Anxiety and depression are rising, and according to a Kaiser Family Health Foundation poll, nearly half of Americans report the coronavirus is harming their mental health. A federal emergency hotline for people in emotional distress registered a more than 1,000% increase in April compared to the same time last year. Last month, 20,000 people texted that hotline. The fear of contacting the disease, the loss of jobs, the isolation from our friends and for children from their classmates, the collapse of our economy has many Americans afraid, in despair, and for many, depressed. And then we turn on our televisions and we watch one of the most heinous crimes in our history as a white police officer puts his knee into the neck of a black man and holds it there until he has snuffed out his life. I do not have words in my vocabulary to express how angry and upset I am over this. That should never happen any place on God's green earth, let alone on American soil. That police officer's assault was not just an assault upon George Floyd. It was an assault on all of us, and especially on other good and 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 proper police officers whom we love and treasure and support. I'm grieved and I'm appalled that this could happen in our country. God help us and God forgive us. And then activist groups seize upon the moment and send in their anarchists to burn down the city. So is it any wonder that we're depressed? We're all under pressure and it's palpable. So once again, we turn to the Psalms. And David was also a man who understood pressure. A different kind to be sure, but he was a man of vision, a wise military and governmental leader, even a man gifted in music and poetry and dancing. But he dealt with pressure both before and after he became Israel's second king. As a result, like many people who love and trust God, David struggled with discouragement and despair and depression. He especially coped with a with a turbulent emotions during his fugitive years. David was fleeing for his life from the wrath of King Saul. And he had to bolster strength and courage through devastating days of fear. Facing many of these things alone, he he turned for solace to music and worship as well as the comforts of writing about his feelings. In fact, students of the Psalms believe that David wrote at least eight different Psalms during the years that he was running away from Saul. The superscription beneath the heading of our Psalm, Psalm 142, tells us we've come to a contemplation of David, a prayer when he was in the cave. Now, David was running away from the most powerful man in his world, nearly always outnumbered and without the support of anything close to the armament of his enemy. In fact, on one occasion, Saul had over 30,000 men looking for David. As we examine this episode of David's life here in Psalm 142, he has finally stumbled across a refuge and he's found a sanctuary in the midst of the wilderness. He's come to a place where he can lay low, pour out his heart to God, and sort out the shattered fragments of his life. He's found a cave, and he's entered the darkness of the cave of despair. It helps us to follow David's story. If nothing else, we can discover that we aren't the only ones who have experienced discouragement. And one of the reasons we wear out the pages of the Psalms is that it helps us simply to know that somebody has gone, this, gone through this before us, even thousands of years before us. We comfort in recognizing the emotions we're feeling here and now displayed in a man who lived so long ago. What a treasure we have in our hands. David preserved all these honest emotions and wise prescriptions he maintained an invaluable journal that has never lost its power or its richness. 
And David went beyond simple journaling. He went beyond simply recording for us the events of his life. He wrote out his prayers to God, and he kept an account of God's workings. Here in our Bibles, we can actually chart the course of David's life as he moves through the series of crises and emerges victorious on the other side. As we find David, he is now seeking solace in the cave of Adullam. It's interesting to place the Psalms and the historical books of, of David side by side and seek the full context of what's going on in the Psalm. We can discover, for example, how Psalm 142 seems to flow from the life of David. From the historical part in 1 Samuel, here's what we read. David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, everyone who was discontented gathered to him, so he became captain over them, and there were about 400 men with him. Now what was happening? Most scholars believe King Saul had levied a tax on the people of Israel. It would then be clear that people were flocking to this cave of Adullam to be with David in their anger and rebellion over the unfair taxation. They were poor people. They had very little, and many of them were the very people who had insisted before God that they needed a king. So be careful what you pray for. Saul was that king. Many others of the 400 men, no doubt, were old friends of David who gathered to lend their support to him. Goliath's conqueror was still admired by most citizens of the nation of Israel. And as word leaked out concerning their hero's flight, more and more of them decided to join David in his hiding place. In fact, in the next chapter of 1 Samuel, we discover that the number grew from 400 to 600. Now, needless to say, this cave was no foxhole on the side of the hill. It was a huge cavern with a 40-foot opening. So we have David fleeing his problems, fleeing Saul, fleeing life. Finally, he's come across a place of respite, and suddenly there are great crowds of people flowing toward him from every direction. What kind of people are these? Well, <laughs> not exactly the best or the brightest. These are the debtors, the troublemakers, the discontented who are flocking to the side of David. How do you think he feels about all this company? Now keep in mind, David is sick and he's discouraged. I believe he sought a cave not only for safety but also for solitude. The fact is that misery doesn't always love company and the last people we want to be with us in our despair are those with problems to match our own. And that's why I can't imagine what this massive social call must have been like for David. I mean, he's struggling just to cope with his own turbulent emotions. And now all of the outcasts of Israel are straggling to his side in the cave of Adullam. So David, having entered a cave to be alone, finds himself surrounded by the most distressed citizens of Israel. I imagine he has taken a hard look at his life and his place among the people of Israel before coming to his journal to write this psalm. David is introspective. He's emotional and very transparent with those emotions. His feelings flow out in the psalms and music and praise and tears. We began the psalm with the discouragement of David. Maybe you're among some that I've met over the years who think Christians shouldn't show emotions. Some believers seem to have adopted that very peculiar notion, Christian deportment, according to the grim stereotype, is a calm, plain, vanilla demeanor characterized by a pleasant smile that never wavers even when the lions are chasing us around the Roman arena. Supposedly, putting on a happy faith is the visual proof of godliness. But David, a man after God's own heart, vented his emotions in violent colors and operatic crescendos. We wince when we read some of his work. You need only take a close look at the psalm before us. The journal entry never denies honest emotion. There can be little doubt that the author is a man whose very soul is in distress. 
So let's take a closer look at the discouragement of David. First of all, he feels disoriented. Psalm 142 and verse 3 says, My spirit was overwhelmed within me. <clears throat> David confesses to us in Psalm 142 verse 3 that his spirit within is overwhelmed. The Hebrew words literally mean the muffling of my spirit. What vivid terminology. Have you ever felt a muffled spirit? David has come to a place where he has begun to distrust the powers of his own judgment. He's no longer certain where to turn or what course to take. Life has become a great flood rushing in upon him, and he struggles to stand firm against the current. David's muffled spirit is a picture of disorientation. He is pursued by two armies, one made up of soldiers and the other of sufferers. His life is entangled in a knot of problems which thread should be loosened first. If you read his story, you discover that he has recently made a serious mistake. His entanglement has distracted him from the will of God for a period of time with tragic results. As punishment for harboring his prey, Saul slaughtered the village of Nob, which cared for David during his prodigal journey from God's will. And David realizes that he is spiritually responsible for the mass slaying of an entire village. He's nearly driven insane with guilt. He's entered the darkened depths of the cave to contemplate the darkened depths of his soul. But the crowd will prevent the solitude his grief now craves. I've often imagined David slumped within the silence of the cave his head in his hands, reflecting on the place to which his life has brought him. Shadows flicker at the edge of his vision, and he hears the approaching echo of voices. His gaze travels to the passage of the cavern. There, a rough assortment of people is beginning to swell the passageway. They're shouting about taxes and family problems and a thousand other worries. David closes his eyes with a sinking heart. He puts his head further down in his hands, and he whispers, O oh Lord God, what now? What would you have me to do? He feels lost and disoriented, but that's not the only emotion he's feeling. He also feels deserted. We come to the fourth verse of our psalm. In my estimation, it's one of the saddest verses in the Bible. Here's what David writes. Psalm 142, verse 4, Look on my right hand and see, for there is no one who acknowledges me. Refuge has failed me. No one cares for my soul. Can you imagine any words more desolate or despairing? This is the same David who wrote in Psalm 16, 8, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. There had been a time when he felt the Lord God always at his right hand. If God was for him, who could be against him? Life was rewarding and victorious, and no matter where he was or what he was doing, the Lord was always there. But the pit into which his soul has plunged is a dark one. He sits in, in one most appropriate, most symbolic place for his mood, a cold, foreboding cave. And even with a mob of supporters closing in, he is more convinced than ever that nobody really cares about him. They care about what he does for them, for the defeating of giants and the fighting of battles, but they don't care about him. He's alone in terms of people. Have you ever felt alone in a crowd of 400? It may seem like a contradiction in terms, but anyone who has ever been lonely will confirm that the greater the number of people present, the more intense can be the feeling of loneliness. That is why large, thriving cities are pockets of despair and alienation. A cave filled with the echoes of demanding voices can be lonely, too. And the psalm suggests to us that David saw the friendly mob and felt the fundamental difference between them and himself. Suddenly, his sense of isolation was a knife in his heart. No one knew the depth of his emotions. No one cared what he felt. No one cared how he suffered. I don't know if you know it, people, but problems tend to isolate us. 
I'm the kind of individual who is certain to turn inward when the problems come. Like a turtle, my head snaps quietly back into the thick protective shell. I want to sort it all out for myself without outside interference. The tendency is to seek the nearest cave that might offer protection from the world and its questions. We believe no one else has ever experienced such a problem as the one we're facing, or such is our feeling. So we bury ourselves in a cave. Scripture commentator Alexander McLaren offers this description of the process. He writes, the soul that has to wade through deep waters has always to do it alone. We have companions in joy, but sorrow we have to face by ourselves. Unless we have Jesus with us in the darkness, we have no one. It matters not how many people are around you, how, uh, how many people are crowding you. You may be in the center of a thousand people, but you'll believe you're hopelessly isolated. Elijah suffered from this misconception. It was he against the world. He was firmly convinced that he was the only prophet left who believed in God. And it took the Lord to remind him that he, the creator, was still in control and that there were a few thousand more soldiers in God's army than the prophet had calculated. So David feels disoriented and he feels deserted, but he also feels depressed. In verse six, David says, I am brought very low. I've come to a very sensitive topic for contemporary Christianity. I've actually heard preachers claim that if you're in a state of depression, you can't be a Christian. Real Christians, they say, don't experience depression. So my first question for these preachers is whether they've read all the Bible or not. I mean, how are we supposed to approach Elijah who was depressed? How are we supposed to understand Jonah who was depressed? And what about Moses? He too faced depression. Then we come to the matter of King David, a man deeply loved by God, a man of profound spiritual experience and wisdom who also grappled with depression throughout his life. The word David uses for depression interestingly enough, is the word for indentation. He applies that condition to his soul. Therefore, David is saying, I am suffering from an indentation in my soul. I am depressed. As a pastor, I've occasionally counseled believers in the midst of depression, and I know what a heavy burden it is for people to be brought very low. <clears throat> I've known people who have suffered such intense depression that they eventually ended their own lives. They looked into the future and saw nothing but emptiness and hopelessness and despair. Heartfelt expressions of hope or encouragement were no longer enough to reach them. Life simply didn't seem worth living anymore, and they chose to forfeit the precious gift of life. If you happen to be in that place, Right now, as you listen to this message, let me say to you, don't do that. God has a plan for your life, and what you're contemplating is not a part of that plan. There is help for you, even as there was for David. David felt a depression that may have approached such a zone of desperation. All of his hope and joy were gone. His thoughts turned inward. At one time, the problem had been a simple one. The king was hunting him down to kill him, but now David's plight was something more abstract, something considerably more complex. David had allowed his circumstances to drive him inward instead of upward, and he had come to fall back on his own resources, and those resources were now spent. The well had run dry. There was nowhere else for David to turn. He no longer sensed the presence of God in his life. But did this mean David was no longer a child of God? Of course not. Believers do indeed enter the dark cave of depression at times, and this is particularly true of godly leaders. These are men and women who dwell in the world of momentous expectations and great ponderous burdens of responsibility. They wear the mantle of greatness with unease, and quite naturally, great expectations can lead to great depression. So David is in this cave, and he feels disoriented. He feels deserted. He feels depressed, and he feels defeated. Once again, verse 6 of Psalm 142. 
Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. They were the better team today. How, how often have you heard athletes express that sentiment after losing a game or coming up short in a contest? Lots of times. I've often felt it somewhat cruel to force professional athletes to endure press conferences when they lose. I mean, these men and women put forth incredible effort on the field of play, often sacrificing their own bodies in their search for victory. And when they do win, of course, they enjoy talking about their experiences to journalists and fans afterwards. But who doesn't like basking in the glow of victory? It's really hard to watch athletes try to grapple with the reality of defeat with cameras and microphones pressed to their faces. I mean, what can you say when the final score already says it all? What excuses can you offer when no excuses are accepted? The reality is nobody likes grappling with their own defeat, including David. And in the grip of his low spirits, David cries out to the Lord in verse 6, Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. He turns his focus to his enemies like a football player on the losing end of the Super Bowl. He can only say, they were the better team. David is in a place where he can see nothing but grim prospects. He's wearing dark glasses that tint the entire world in shades from gray to black. He does what most of us do when we're feeling low. He sits within his cave with a yellow legal pad and proceeds to take inventory of his life, placing each element in one or two columns marked good news and bad news. And when he gets to the bottom line, he takes a look and concludes, I've got some bad news and some more bad news. Nothing good seems to be visible through the dark glasses in a dim cave. The assets are zero and the liabilities are endless. One of those itemized listings would have read, my enemies are stronger than I am, and you can be sure that's a man's depression talking. David would like to be counting his blessings if only he knew where they went. Depression is not the best venue for formulating objective conclusions. Sober reasoning is impossible. David goes on to compare himself to a man in prison in verse 7. And so he is. He's a prisoner of his own perspective. He has locked himself into the dungeon of despair and thrown away the key. We can only be thankful to God that he made his escape. We've been going down, down into the cave, but now we're going to take a journey upward. We're going to see how David defeated his discouragement. There can be no doubt that discouragement defeated David there had been a time when he had sent a stone into a giant's head. Now he had encountered a giant that could get into his own head. But for the people of God, there is never a pit too deep to escape. There is never a cave too dark for God's light to illuminate. And finally, as the Scriptures attest, David defeated discouragement. He traveled a path to liberation from the imprisonment of his mind. He left a map for all of us who follow when we feel hopelessly lost in our despair. We simply need to listen to the Word of God. First of all, David verbalized his problems to God. Look back at the beginning of the psalm. I cry out to the Lord with my voice, verse 1. Verse 5, I cried out to you, O Lord. Verse 6, attend to my cry. Perhaps David is a man after God's own heart because he's willing to share his own heart with God. He pours it all out before his Father, especially during times of despair and discouragement. Prayer should be a time of no holes barred, straight-ahead communication with God. We cut to the root of the problem, and we're not afraid to name names. And when that happens, we feel a tremendous sense of unburdening ourselves before the most intimate friend imaginable. God is listening. He cares. He responds, and we can tell him anything at all. Cast human logic and bureaucratic conventions aside. God has said we are to cast all of our cares upon him, period. And if we hold back any burden, we short-circuit the healing process that he is so eager to bring about within us. I found an enthusiastic endorsement of that truth in an unlikely place, an airline magazine. During a flight, I was thumbing through the usual pages of advertisements when I came across a little article on a topic that interested me. 
called journaling. I went on to read the following. Here's what it said. Battling illness and pain with pen and paper may be unorthodox, but it may also spell relief. People who write for 20 minutes a day about traumatic events reduce their doctor visits, improve their immune system, and among arthritis sufferers, use less medication, have greater mobility, says James W. Penbaker, a professor at the University of Texas in Austin, who has conducted studies on the topic. Why the relief, he writes? Suppressing negative emotions can weaken the immune system and arouse your fight or flight system, churning up blood pressure and heart rate. Writing about conflict or trauma helps organize the experience, and the net effect is that people can move beyond the stressful event. The author quotes another PhD, Mark Lamley, an associate professor of psychology at Wayne State University in Detroit. This scholar theorized that the positive results of journaling have something to do with the nature of pain. Writing about stressful events relieves the emotional part of pain. That's when the patient says, I can still feel it, but it doesn't bother me as much. It is interesting to me that as science stumbles along in the modern world, it tends to come across truths that are in the Word of God that have been there for thousands of years. This particular article concluded that it's important for us to honestly express the issues of our lives. That's what the Lord has been trying to tell us all along. If a candid journal can be a healthy thing, how much more an honest, prayerful expression can be? In fact, when I journal, it's simply my prayers written out in longhand, written out in my computer. I write them out. I tell God what's going on in my life. I started doing that during my bouts with cancer, and I discovered the power of expressing what's going on in your life to God in terms that you would, you would never be embarrassed about to show anyone. Bring your concerns before the Lord. Insert Almighty God into the equation of that ma magazine article with all of its research experts and the effectiveness of what they're prescribing, and you will see that God is much better than any journal when you bring your problems to him in prayer. When you find yourself within the dark, cold walls of the cave feeling isolated and depressed, aren't you glad you have a God whose patience has no limits, whose love can never be exhausted, and whose tender mercies never come to an end? Aren't you glad you can write down your thoughts, lift up your voice, and say, Lord, here, I've expressed it. This is exactly what I'm feeling, and I know I can offer it to you without fear or shame. When you do that, when you, when you follow that process, God begins the process of recovery. So the first thing David did was verbalize his problems to God. Then he recognized his presence before God. He says in verse 3, when my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then you knew my path. David has verbalized his problems before God. He has unrolled them as if they were a great scroll holding all the secrets of his mind and heart. And suddenly he makes a startling realization. All this time he has been pouring out his heart. God was already at work with David on his discouragement. Every moment David felt overwhelmed by problems, God was busy dealing with them. Every second David despaired over the lack of God's presence, God was right there as close as ever. God knew about David and his depression and every single problem he'd ever had or would have in the future. And God knows. Our term for that is omniscient. It means he knows every detail of your life and your feelings. So David verbalized his problems to God. Then he recognized that God was present with him. And then he began to realize his provision in God. He says in verse 5, You are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. David has remembered he's praying to the creator of heaven and earth. Now he begins to rejoice in the provision that God has made for him. I remember an old preacher who once commented unforgettably on this verse. He said, there's no living in the land of the living like living on the living God. And the land of the living is not a reference to eternity or heaven. It's just a reference to living right now. Aren't you glad the Bible has been written for people who are living in the land of the living? 
It's about so much more than pie in the sky and the sweet by and by. The Bible is written for the rough routines of life, the nitty gritty of the here and now. It is intended to help those of us who rise early every morning and drive to work and punch the clock to face genuine challenges. Its pages are filled with real life solutions for real life problems. So David verbalized his problems to God. He recognized his presence before God and he realized his provision in God. And then he resumed his praise to God. Verse 7, he said, O God, bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise your name. The righteous shall surround me, for you shall deal bountifully with me. David has moved from the depths to the heights in these few verses, and he is ready to praise God again. Prayer will do that for us. We can pray our way right through the pressure. David began the psalm with a sigh, and he's going to end it with a song. We can pray our way right through the sickness. We can pray our way right through the crisis and the losses and the fears. And if we will only come before him honestly, he'll meet the needs in our lives, every one of them. David has traveled from prison to praise. He recorded the journey in his masterpiece known as Psalm 142. And I like to imagine that he wrote a sequel I enjoy picturing him recording the final word of Psalm 142, then turning the pages of his journal to begin Psalm 57, another psalm written in that cave. This piece is a teaching psalm of David when he fled from Saul into the cave. Most scholars believe that Psalm 57 was written at the same time or in the same setting as Psalm 142. But this one is much more like a song. It's closer to the hymns we sing in joyful worship of God. It's structured in two verses and one chorus. Here's the chorus of Psalm 57. Psalm 57, 5. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. We know those, those words. We, we sing those words, don't we? And we can just imagine David's beautiful singing voice, the first voice to sing so many of these immortal psalms, echoing through the cold, stony walls of the cave, a beautiful melody dispersing the darkness. In an echo chamber, it doesn't take a loud voice to be heard for many miles. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, David begins to sing. Imagine the setting. The voice is clear and beautiful and soulful as it befits a singer who has known years of deep turmoil. Nothing but the one voice can be heard in those rocky corridors. And then suddenly, another voice joins him in unlikely harmony. And the duet continues along, and just like that, one by one, a choir of 400 singers is lifting one mighty choral voice together. There has never been such a concert in all of history, and there may never be another unless it will occur in a Roman Colosseum or a a German prison camp in a place where music and hope and laughter were thought to have been cast out forever. It is the music of the miraculous. In a cave of exile, David and his choir pour out a song of praise. Their concert hall is a natural geological sound chamber, one whose acoustics were designed by God long ago for this very earth-shaking, despair-breaking moment. The people sing on, praising God, their voices penetrating the massive stone of the natural ceiling to drift to the very portals of heaven, and perhaps even the angels stop to listen. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. I can almost see it in my mind. I can feel it in my heart. In the midst of his despair, surrounded by the off-scouring of the earth, David begins to realize his hope is in God. And his one singular voice begins to pour out his soul to God. I exalt thee. We say our final goodbye to this week's worship service. Let me remind you that in the midst of all of the things we're experiencing right now, you really need God. And if you don't know God in a personal way, 
If you've never received his son, Jesus Christ, as your savior, perhaps God has brought you to this place for such a moment. Maybe the emotions you're feeling in your heart and soul maybe maybe edging into what might be depression. Maybe these are the things that you're trying to deal with in your own strength without any help from outside. I promise you what we're dealing with right now is a God-sized problem and you cannot do it in your own strength. If you don't know Jesus Christ, will you receive him? Will you pray this prayer in your heart? Dear God, I need Jesus Christ in my life. I want to accept him as my savior in this service today. I want to ask Jesus Christ to forgive me of all of my sin and give me the gift of eternal life which he has promised in his word. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. I believe you are the risen Christ. I believe you are the savior of the world. I want to make a decision today to receive you into my life. Lord Jesus, come into my life and take up your residence in my heart and guide me through life and especially through these days. And if you make a decision like that, there's a place on your screen where you can record that you have prayed to receive Christ. I hope you will do it. We have people ready to talk with you and deal with you and help you. Most of all, we want to pray with you. So what I'm going to do is pray and then Michael is going to sing us out and we'll be on our way. Once again, thank you for joining us, Shadow Mountain Online. Now, Father, take the Word of God and use it to change our lives. Bless those who are praying right now and have prayed to receive you as Savior. May this be the beginning of new days for so many people who are listening to this service. And Lord Jesus Christ, get glory to your name in all of this. May your name be praised as our prayer, and we thank you for another good day in church here at Shadow Mountain. In Jesus' name, amen. have a unique set of talents and gifts that bring you joy when you use them. But that's only half of their purpose. God can also use them for His will. Today on Turning Point, Dr. David Jeremiah explains how the musical talents of young David not only soothed the king, but were used by God for a higher purpose. Listen now as David introduces the conclusion of Saul's moods and David's music. Well, it's a wonderful thing to be teaching the life of David. And our resource for the month of June is so integrated into this study because David, who was the author of the Psalms, which is the music of the Old Testament, um, is, is part of this resource. And his son Solomon is the other part. Uh, David wrote the Psalms. And when we read the Psalms, we learn how to know and love and relate to God. His son Solomon wrote Proverbs. And when we read Proverbs, we learn how to relate to one another, how to deal with problems. Uh, uh, Proverbs is an incredibly encouraging and instructive book. So here's David and his son. One writes the Psalms, one writes the Proverbs. The Psalms relate to God. The Proverbs help us relate to one another. So we've taken all of David's writing and the writing of Solomon, his son, for the book of Proverbs, and we've packaged it together in a beautiful devotional book called The Focus Life. And uh, here's how it works. Every day you read five Psalms, that's David, and one chapter from Proverbs, that's his son Solomon. 
and you do that every day for a month, and you will read the whole book of Psalms and the whole book of Proverbs. And many people do this every month because the reoccurring impact of those two books on your heart is overwhelming. We'd like to make that possible for you by sending you this beautiful leather-covered, gold-embossed um, copy of these two books from the Bible bound together in a book for you to read every day. We've called it The Focus Life, and it's our way of saying thank you for your gift to Turning Point during the month of June. One of our best resources ever. We hope you'll take advantage of it this month and get your copy. Send a gift, and when you do, simply ask for your copy of The Focused Life. Here is part two of Saul's Moods and David's Music. Well, this intruding spirit came now to take up the place where God's spirit once had been. And literally what the text says is that this evil spirit was terrorizing Saul. Notice, but the spirit of the Lord departed and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him, troubled him. Now the word there is a word which means to overwhelm him. It sounds like uh, Saul would be going along doing everything all right and then he would just be overwhelmed with his evil spirit. It would just come upon him at the most unexpected times and he would be filled with terror and depression and discouragement. Robert Browning has written a poem about Saul and pictures him in his dark tent, leaning up against the tent pole, and the picture is one of demonic uh, dimensions in many respects. It shows the blackness and the cloud of depression that comes over this man. It's like what we say sometimes when we talk about something we do that we shouldn't do. We say, well, I don't know, something just came over me. Well, this happened to Saul over and over again. This dark spirit came over him and he was depressed. It wasn't rejection. It wasn't necessarily what you and I today might call depression. It was almost like a demonic possession and the people who were close to Saul recognized something was wrong with him. For we read in verse 15 that Saul's servants initiated the conversation and they came to him and said, you have an evil spirit from God troubling you. You have a problem, Saul. So they make, after we have the intruding spirit, they make an interesting suggestion. Notice verses 15 through 17. Verse 16, they said, Let our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is a cunning player on a harp, and it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. Now, I'd just like to ask you a question, and I don't want you to answer out loud. Did they give Saul good advice? Think about it for a moment. Was that sound counsel on the part of the servants? Saul, what you need is you need a musician to come in and soothe your spirit. Well, as we get to the end of the chapter, we will discover that God used that to refresh Saul. That's true. But was that really what Saul needed? Did Saul need to be refreshed or did Saul need to repent? It seems to me that what they should have said to him had they been godly counselors would have been something like this. They should have said, since it's an evil spirit in you from the Lord, why don't you make peace with God and repent? Why don't you call Samuel to come and pray with you, Saul? Why don't you get right with God? Why don't you deal with the source of the evil spirit and it'll go away? Deal with the source of discouragement and depression. Take care of the reason for the dark cloud and then you will be all right. But it sounds to me like those servants were like uh, humanistic counselors of today, which tell us, don't deal with your problem. Just do what you can to so it doesn't hurt so much. <laughs> don't make the problem go away. Just sort of cover it up with some assuaging truth. Or as many have tried today, find the answer in a bottle or in drugs or in some other exotic way of dealing with the pain. Well, they discovered that one of the ways they could deal with the pain of depression in Saul's life was to get a musician. And so they suggested, let's find somebody who's really good, who's a skillful player. Let's find somebody who can come in and play the harp. Now, I must stop here for a moment and debunk this story from a common conception we have. I've actually seen pictures of David uh, seated on a little stool with his legs straddling the harps that you and I know today. 
And I've often wondered how in the world he drugged that thing around the hillsides of Bethlehem. Seems to me that would have been rather cumbersome. But it wasn't like that at all. Actually, the word in the text is not the word harp. It's the word lyre, L-Y-R-E. It's a common instrument in the Old Testament, and it was a very interesting instrument. It was made, uh, believe it or not, out of the small intestine of a sheep. And they would take that and stretch it out over a piece of wood that had an empty place in it and attach it to a bracket at the end. And then they would stretch the strings to different tautness and they would play on those strings with their fingers. So we have the interesting suggestion and then now we have the inspired selection. Who did they select? They selected David. And I want you to note the resume that was his in verse 18. If you could file a resume like verse 18, you would be rich indeed. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in playing, a mighty valiant man and a man of war, prudent in matters and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Now, there are actually six statements about David in that verse, and there are probably five qualifications in the six statements. First of all, the Bible says he was a skillful musician. You may wonder why it's important that those two words go together. But I want to remind you, he's being called to play for the king. And if you're going to play for the king, you have to be good. You can't be finding your notes. You can't be trying to figure out what string to pluck at what time. If you're going to play for the king and not cause him to be more depressed than he was before you played, you have to be good. And so they looked for a skillful person. I just can't help but remind you, all of you who minister in the things of music, that we always play for the king. And God expects us to do our best. He's not asking us to be perfect, and surely God knows if we have done our best and we sing a wrong note or play a wrong note, he will accept that as from a heart of love and devotion. But I am afraid that far too often in the church of Jesus Christ, we forget that we are playing for the king, and anything will do. I have actually heard people say, well, you need to understand, it's just the church. I thank God for the commitment to excellence he has put within the heart of our minister of music and all the people that work with him to be committed to understand that when we play or when we sing, it is for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So they looked for a skillful musician. Then secondly, they said that this man that was going to come to the palace was a strong warrior. There are two phrases that describe it. He was a mighty man of valor and a man of war. The mighty man of valor probably grew out of David's reputation as a stalwart young man who fought off bears and lions by himself. In the 17th chapter, he gives testimony to the fact that he took on a lion and a bear all by himself, and he won. A historian that I read this week has an interesting insight into the second phrase, that he was a man of war. This historian said that the Philistines who challenged the Israelites in the person of Goliath in the valley were also carrying on numerous border incidents around Palestine and that they would come into Palestine and raid. And it is quite possible that David may have been caused to defend himself against one of the raiding Philistine parties while he was out in the field with his sheep. And he became known as somebody you don't want to mess with. He was a mighty man of valor and a man of war. So he was a skillful musician and a strong warrior. Notice, thirdly, he was a shrewd speaker. That's exactly what the phrase means. He was prudent in matters. Literally, it means he was able to say the right thing at the right time. He wouldn't embarrass you with his tongue. Boy, if you're going to have somebody standing in the presence of the king, he needs to be somebody who is shrewd in his speaking, who will say the right thing at the right time. David was the kind of a person who wouldn't embarrass you with his mouth. Have you ever been around people who have the ability to say the right thing at the wrong time? Or the wrong thing at the right time? Oh, it is embarrassing to be around people like that because you never know what is going to come out and you never know what to do when they say it. David wasn't like that. He was a man who was prudent in matters. He was shrewd as a speaker. 
The next phrase in his resume that qualified him to stand before the king says that he was a comely person. That means he was a sharp guy. He was a sharp personality. If you want to capture all that's involved in that phrase, I don't know how to say it any better. Somebody said, tell me about David. And I say, David is a sharp guy. He is a sharp guy. Well, you say, what do you mean by that, Pastor? I mean that David is the kind of person who has this magnetism about him. We call it charisma in the first message. Dr. F.B. Meyer, in his book on David, kind of brings all of this together with this wonderful statement. He says, he was David the beloved. Wherever he moved, he cast the spell of his personal magnetism. Saul yielded to it and thawed out. The servants of the royal household loved him. Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. The soul of Jonathan was knit with his soul. The women of Israel forgot their loyalty to Saul as they sounded the praises of the young hero who was so goodly to look upon. The wild, rough soldiers were willing to risk their lives in order to gratify his wish for a drink from Bethlehem's well. So he passed through life, swaying the scepter of irresistible potency over men and women. That was David. He had a magnetism about him. You couldn't be in his presence without knowing this person is unique. So as they reviewed the qualities of this man, that he was skillful in music, a strong warrior, a shrewd speaker, a sharp person, and then lastly, the most important of all, a spiritual man and a godly man. I don't know what there was about David that recommended his godliness to this young servant, but it was quite apparent that David was different. He was godly. Say, David was a man after God's heart, and we learned what it means to be a man after God's heart. It means to have the heart that God has. And I wonder sometimes as I read about David's reputation, what kind of reputation we have. Do people know us as godly people? Do those who watch us in the things we do observe us, and when they have opportunity to give testimony, say, yeah, I know him. He's a godly man. I've said that about people. I don't think there's a higher compliment that you can pay to a person than to be able to say of that person, he's a godly person. She's a godly person. They have a spiritual quality that recommends them. And may I take the liberty to join together the first and the last qualities for just a moment because we're talking about music? May I suggest to you that the only really skillful musicians in the eyes of God are those who are godly people in the process. It seems to me that that note needs to be struck today because in the Christian entertainment world, which passes for the music world, there seems to me to be an awful lot going on that doesn't put those two together. We have forgotten what it means to encourage and we have replaced it with entertainment. And we have forgotten what it means to be godly in our ministry and in our demeanor. And we have taken over the position of the showman in the Christian world. We have many, many musicians who cross this platform over the months and the years of our ministry. I want to say to you men and women that there is an immediately a difference between them. You can tell within just a short time where these people are coming from. There's a group uh, that like to come to a church and take your platform over for a short time so they can do their thing at your expense. They don't care about anything except you've given them your platform. They're going to do what they want to do while they're there, hope for a good offering, and go their way. And then there are other people who come. Tell us what you want. Let us be a part of the ministry that you're having. And their spirit is one of submission and godliness and one of ministry. They have brought skillful music and spirituality together. And when that happens, that ministers to the body of Christ. And those are the kind of people you want to have coming back over and over again. Well, the inspired selection now becomes the insignificant servant. Notice verses 19 and 20. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. 
And Jesse took an ass laden with bread and a bottle of wine and a kid and sent them by David, his son, unto Saul. I don't have time to talk about this much, except that is a strange sight, isn't it? Here is this young boy who's already been anointed as king. He's on his way down to see Saul, where he's going to serenade him away from his uh, depression. And the best that Jesse could send was this little humble gift, a donkey with a bottle of wine and some bread. He, he's on his journey, and God has chosen David. Not only has he chosen him, he's already anointed him. He is not going to be king in the eyes of God. He is king. God's already rejected Saul. He's already accepted David. But before David can take the throne, he is demonstrating again how the Lord loves to prove that he is not into the mighty things. He's into the weak things. He's not into the significant things. He loves to take the insignificant, that no flesh may glory in his presence. Now note the intriguing solution. Verses 21 through 23 says that when David came to Saul and stood before him, that Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And then Saul sent back to Jesse, and he said, Let David stand before me, and I, let, let him stay with me, for he's found favor in my sight. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took a harp and played with his hand, and Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Let me just point out two or three things in these verses before we close. Would you notice that here is the king in waiting, David, and the scripture says that he came to stand before Saul, and the phrase stand before means, and in fact, in my Bible, it's in the margin, that David came and reported for service to Saul. Here is the king who is about to be crowned, but not yet, and he comes and stands before Saul, and he says, reporting for duty, sir. Isn't that an incongruent picture? The leader serving, the king standing before the king. And the Bible says that when he ministered to Saul and served him, watch carefully, that Saul loved David. And I am reminded that there is always that relationship between a servant and those he serves. It ought to be so in the church of Jesus Christ that when we serve one another, we build a bond of love between one another. That's the greatest way to express love in the body is through service. That's why Jesus taught the disciples the foot washing ceremony to teach them that they are never greater than when they stoop to minister to one another's needs. And David is teaching us that lesson, that as he stood before Saul reporting for duty, he caused God to knit Saul's heart to him, and they became close in their relationship. Love grows out of ministry. And David walking around with the armor of Saul as his armor bearer, had with him close at hand his harp. And when Saul would get depressed, when the evil spirit from the Lord would come upon him and he would begin to feel that whatever it was coming over him, David began to skillfully stroke the strings until, as the scripture says, Saul was refreshed. And the word refreshed there literally means he breathed easy. It seems to me that there are two things that are stamped all over this chapter we have read today, things that we can't get away from no matter how hard we try. It seems to me, first of all, that this chapter has a very strong thing to say to us about music. It tells us that the ministry to misery is music. God uses music to minister to hearts, and he uses it in a very wonderful way to bring healing and refreshment, and we've talked about that to some degree. Here's a wonderful picture of how music can be used of God to minister to the needs and the hearts of men and women. And I would like to take just a moment to remind you that God uses a lot of different kinds of music to minister to a lot of different kinds of people. I don't know what David played on the harp, but I would imagine if we could hear it today, some of us wouldn't like it. And some of us might even think it isn't godly. And some of us might say, we aren't having that in this church anymore. 
Let me suggest one last enduring lesson from this chapter. The training for leading is serving. Isn't it interesting that David was selected king? (laughs) It was really interesting that God selected David king while he was a shepherd. And there was no leadership institute for David to attend. There wasn't any place where he could go to learn how to be a king. And I want to tell you something. You don't learn how to be a king chasing sheep around the hillside. And so God had to figure out a way to get David some training so he could come to the kingship and be prepared. And he took one gift that David had, his gift of music, and he parlayed that gift of music into an opportunity for David to have free training from the man he was going to replace. And through that gift of music, he was brought into the kingdom. Saul trained him. David watched what was going on. He learned the protocol of the palace. And while he was serving Saul, he was learning how to be a king. And when Saul finally passed over the scene, David just moved without hardly even shifting gears right into the place where he had been protected and where he'd been trained. It seems to me that that's true in all of our lives. God prepares us to lead by teaching us to serve. And if you're going to be a leader, you're going to have to learn how to be a server. If you're going to have others in submission to you, you need to learn how to be in submission to others. One of the reasons why in the college uh, we think it's good to learn how to be in submission because if you can't be in submission in the college setting, how are you ever going to be a leader out in the future someplace? You learn how to lead by learning how to serve. So as God uses you with whatever gift he may have chosen in your life as a teacher or as a musician or in some other fashion, while you're exercising that gift, God may be using your service to train you up so that someday you can be a leader. Don't rebel against the process. It's God's only way. And you know what God does? He puts us sometimes in obscure places where we wonder if there's any advantage to just doing our best every day. And then when we do, the Bible says he finds out who's faithful and he promotes them. Uh, Faithful over a few things, I will make you ruler over many, says the scripture. So you may be in one of those places. Maybe you're a bivocational pastor and you wonder if anybody cares. Hardly anyone comes because there's nobody to come to your church. But every week you prepare and you work hard and you go and you speak to those 40 or 50 people and you think, is God really listening? Does he know what I'm doing? And I promise you he does. He's taking notes. (laughs) And uh, you be faithful, whatever it is. Faithful in little things get you opportunity to be faithful in bigger things. Tomorrow, we're going to go to the main event because tomorrow is the beginning of the story of David and Goliath. The main story in this whole thing starts tomorrow here on the Friday edition of Turning Point, and you don't want to miss it. I'll see you then. I'm David Jeremiah. Today's message originated from Shadow Mountain Community Church and senior pastor, Dr. David Jeremiah. If Turning Point is helping you to grow your faith, please share it with us by writing to Turning Point, P.O. Box 3838, San Diego, California, 92163. Visiting our website at davidjeremiah.org slash radio or calling 800-947-1993. Ask for your copy of The Focus Life a month of daily readings from Psalms and Proverbs in a beautiful leather-bound book, yours for a gift of any amount. You can also download the free Turning Point mobile app for your smartphone or tablet, or search in your app store for the keywords Turning Point Ministries to access our programs and resources. Visit davidjeremiah.org slash radio for details. This is David Michael Jeremiah. Join us tomorrow as we continue the series, The Tender Warrior, on Turning Point with Dr. David Jeremiah.
times, it might feel like everything in your life is out of control. But make no mistake, God is still in control. Do you wonder why He lets you suffer? Today on Turning Point, Dr. David Jeremiah examines why God often allows His children to go through times of hardship instead of intervening with a rescue. To introduce the conclusion of his powerful message, Psalm for a Dark Night, here's David. I want to thank you for joining us. This is a discussion of the 71st Psalm in a series called When Your World Falls Apart. We'll get to the last part of that psalm in just a moment, but before we go there, a couple of reminders. Um, March is just around the corner. It seems like a long way from now, but it is not. And our tour to Israel is March the 12th through the 22nd. Little by little, uh, the rooms that are necessary in the Holy Land are being taken. Uh, we already have a huge number of people who've responded. I only say that because I don't want you to miss this. This is a great opportunity to go to Israel with a group of wonderful people who love Jesus, who love the Holy Land, who love worship, who love the Word of God, and to be a part of this great community that goes to this great land. And it's March the 12th through the 22nd. Muriel Vega and Michael Sanchez will be our guests. We'll do all the things that you do when you go to the Holy Land and you want to be a part of this. Go to our website for all the information and be sure to sign up as soon as you can. Well, today we're ready for a part two of A Psalm for a Dark Night. This is Psalm 71. It's one of the psalms I read in the night while I was in the hospital recovering from cancer. And this is a very encouraging psalm. Listen up. What I love about the psalms is they were written by a real person who faced trials just like we face, and he didn't try to put a spin on them. <laughs> he just told it like it was. Well, you say, Pastor Jeremiah, that's reality of trials and the result of trials in our life. What do we do with them? Someone has said the psalm is filled with great praise and great complaining all at once. And I don't know if that's true, but I know that after you get past David saying what it really was like in his own life, he takes the high road and he shows us a direction. And I hope if you don't hear anything else I say, you kind of write down these few things because I believe these are critical to all of us. We don't have a theology of adversity in the church these days. We've got all of this prosperity gospel that's so permeated all of the stuff we do so that now we have positive this and positive that. And how many of you know that as much as you'd like it to be, life just isn't always positive. Sometimes the positive things get interrupted. I'd like it to be positive, but I'm a very positive thinker. But I'm going to tell you something. If you don't have a plan going into adversity, you won't do very well with it. Sooner or later, all of us face it of one kind or another. Unexpected, unannounced, uncharted, unplanned. What do you do? Well, let's follow through with David in his plan of operation. Notice, first of all, the response to his trials. He remembered the character of God. Notice again the first three verses. Notice what he said. In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my strong refuge to which I may resort continually. You have given the commandment to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Whenever we face our trials, we need to remember who God is. Sometimes we get so focused on our trials, we forget that. We need to go back as believers and focus on the character of God. It's interesting to me that as you take your pen and you go through this psalm and you mark it carefully, David filled his whole prayer here. His whole psalm is filled with references to the very character of God himself. For instance, he remembers the glory of God in verse 8. In verse 18, he talks about the power and the strength of God. In verse 22, which is a very special part of this psalm, he says that he will remember the faithfulness of God and your faithfulness, oh my God. And here's the thing that really surprised me, and if you could see my Bible, you'd see that I'd written over these words in this psalm. Five different times in Psalm 71, David talks about the righteousness of God. You will find it 
in verses 1, 15, and 16, 19, and 24. In each of those verses, David refers to the righteousness of God. And when I first saw that, I thought, why? And I'll tell you why. I began to understand that one of the things that comes under assault whenever we face trials as believers is the righteousness and goodness of God. And David understood that the one thing he must do when trials were swirling around his head and when his own children were denying him and not honoring him, the one thing he must never forget was that he had a God who was righteous and good, who could be trusted, and he would never allow that thought to ever get out of his mind. And over and over again, he talks about the righteousness of God. My friend, we have a God who can be trusted. We may not understand what's going on in our lives, and there are many things that have happened to me and to you that I can't give a rational human explanation, but I can lay it at the feet of Almighty God and say with all my heart, he knows what he's doing, and he maketh no mistake. He doesn't make any mistakes. Someone had sent this to me. It was typed down on a little thing and inserted in a card. And it was a quotation from a man by the name of Alan Redpath, who years ago was the pastor of the Moody Church. And this is what it said. This we know. There is nothing, no circumstance, no trouble, no testing that can ever touch me until, first of all, it has come past God and past Christ right through to me. If it has come that far, it has come with a great purpose, which I may not understand at this moment. But as I refuse to become panicky, as I lift up my eyes to him and accept it as coming from the throne of God for some great purpose of blessing for my own heart, no sorrow will ever disturb me, no trial will ever disarm me, no circumstance will ever cause me to fret. I shall rest in the joy of what my Lord is in his character. He is God. He knows what he's doing. Someone else wrote this to me on their card that was an answer from God to a person who was going through trials. And this is the word from God. You must learn to live with the insecurities and the ambiguities of life. But know this, I am secure, I am certain, and I am not ambiguous. In the storm, I am your rock that cannot be moved. I am your God. Isn't that what we need? So we come back and we have a sense of the confidence that is ours in God and his character. Second thing, review the compassion of God. I haven't time to talk about this much except let's read the verses together, verses 4 through 6 and then the first part of verse 17. Listen to what David said. Deliver me, O God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man, for you are my hope, O Lord. You are my trust, watch this, from my youth. By you I have been upheld from birth. You are the one who took me out of my mother's womb. My praise shall be continually of you. And then in verse 17a, he said, oh God, you have taught me from my youth. What did David do? He simply goes back in his memory bank and he reviews what he knows to be true. That God has proven to be faithful to him throughout all of his life. Isn't that a heritage that we all have? We go back and say, God, you have blessed and been faithful and you've watched over me and guided me. You gave me godly parents from the very moment I was born. I was nurtured on the word of God as if it was my mother's milk. And Lord, you took me through the troubled teenage years when I could have gone south and you wanted me to go north. And you watched over me through school and through seminary. And you took me through the early days of ministry when I could have gotten so discouraged I wanted to quit. God, as I look back over my shoulder at your great compassion, great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. And every one of you has a heritage like that. If you've walked with the Lord for even a few weeks, God has been good to you. And the goodness of God that has been extended to you through your life up to this point is simply a reminder to you that God is good and he is compassionate and that he cares. He's not going to change in the middle of your life what he has been doing faithfully throughout eternity. Third, the psalmist gives us another key for dealing with trials. He says... Rejoice in celebration to God. I didn't see this at first, but then all of a sudden it began to just explode. And what I'd like for you to do, so maybe it will explode in your mind, is in this psalm in verse 6, 8, 14, and 15, in verses 22 through 24. Now watch this. 
In the midst of a psalm, when David is pouring out his heart to God over the trouble he's had with his son, Adonijah, and crying out to God because of the absolute terrible pain he feels in his heart, his prayer is filled with worship and praise. You say, where is it, Pastor? Let's read this out loud together. This is from the psalm. Let's read together. My praise shall be continually of you. Let my mouth be filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. But I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and your salvation all the day. For I do not know their limits. Also with the lute I will praise you and your faithfulness, O oh my God. To you I will sing with the harp, O Holy One of Israel. My lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing to you and my soul which you have redeemed. My tongue also shall talk of your righteousness all the day long, for they are confounded, for they are brought to shame who seek my hurt. David just lifts up his voice in praise to God. Ruth the Harms Culkin has written a book called Tell Me Again, Lord, I Forget. And in her book, she wrote this little poetic prayer about praise in difficult times. It goes like this. Lord, just today I read that Paul and Silas were stripped and beaten with wooden whips. Again and again, the rods slashed across their bared backs, but in their desolate dungeon, their feet clamped in stocks, they prayed, they sang, they praised in this musty midnight of my life, Lord, imprisoned in the dungeon of confusion, bound by chains of anguish, help me, please help me to pray, to sing, to praise, until the foundation shakes, until the gates fling open, until the chains fall off, until I am free to share the good news with other chain-bound prisoners. That's what we should pray in the midst of the dark night. Lord, don't ever let me stop praising you. You say, well, I don't feel like it. If you knew what I was going through, the last thing in my mind is praising God. You don't usually feel like praising God in the oncology ward of a hospital, but you do it out of obedience to the Lord, and you watch what God does when you do it. Praise not only benefits God, it benefits the one who offers it. It is a wonderful thing to see how this is a part of David's plan. Then in verse 18, David says that you should renew your consecration to God. And I tell you what, of all the things I read in this chapter, this is the one that stoked my fire. You go through things and you wonder, well, you know, is this the end of the ministry? Is this the end of the road? Is God finished with all this? And I looked at this, and this is what it says. Now also when I am old and gray-headed, watch this, God, do not forsake me, here it is, until I declare your strength to this generation and your power to everyone who is to come. And I took that as my marching orders for the rest of my life. To declare God's strength to this generation. We have an awesome God. Do you know that God can get lost in church? Did you know that? People go to church every Sunday. They don't ever hear anything about God. I've gone to church and not heard anything about God. I've gone to churches well known and I had my full of television services all the time I was gone where you could hardly know if God was there because nobody ever talks about God. I don't ever want to go to church without telling people about how strong and awesome is our God. And then, last but not least, David says you need to reclaim your confidence in God in the future. Notice verse 21. You shall increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. Now please... Hear me carefully. In myself, I don't have any greatness for God to increase. What he's talking about here is his influence and his opportunity to make a difference. He says, increase my greatness and comfort and encourage me on every side. Did you know that trials are meant to improve us? Did you know that? They aren't meant to harm us. Trials are meant to improve us, to make us better men and better women so that by God's grace we can accomplish more and our influence can be greater than it was in the past. God doesn't send those things into our lives to totally destroy us and weaken us so that we can't have any impact for him. First Peter 
chapter 1 and verse 7, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Warren Wiersbe sent me that verse while I was away from y'all, and on the card he wrote these words, which I think may be from one of his books. But I kept it, and this is what it says. When God permits his children to go through the furnace, he keeps one eye on the clock and his hand on the thermostat. His loving heart knows how much and how long. Amen? Isn't that a wonderful thought? God knows what he's doing when he sends trials into our lives. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word. It is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn your statutes. Every time you go through a trial, you shouldn't be asking God why. You can waste a lot of time there because he's not going to tell you. (laughs) He's not going to just open the heavens and say, well, I did this and order that. (laughs) Instead of asking why, why don't you ask what? (laughs) Lord, what do you want me to learn in this process? It will totally change the perspective that you have through your difficulty. Lord, what? James 1.3 says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. 1 Peter 5.10 says, The God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory. You see the relationship? I understand now why I heard when I was a younger man that God isn't going to greatly use someone until he crushes him. And I used to always pray to be the exception, and God doesn't have any exceptions. <laughs> you know, I used to pray, Lord, let me have a ministry without feeling the pain. Before I left to go away for six weeks, I gathered all our staff together. I read to them something that I had found in some notes that I had discovered that very week. It was from the life of Charles Haddon Spurgeon a great preacher of another generation. This is what was such an encouragement to me. I don't know if you ever heard much about Spurgeon's life except for his greatness. He accomplished more in his lifetime than most people will ever accomplish in two lifetimes, and he died at the age of 57. But Spurgeon went through terrible, terrible times in his life. Prolonged bouts of depression and anxiety and all sorts of common problems. His psychological and physical ailments were so crippling that frequently he was confined to bed for weeks. But Spurgeon came to see these problems as part of God's working in his life. His sufferings enabled him to comfort and encourage those who were similarly afflicted. He discovered that his periods of depression invariably preceded a time when God blessed his ministry in a larger way. The depression actually became, said Spurgeon, a sort of John the Baptist for him, heralding a mighty outpouring of God's Spirit. Here are his own words. This depression comes over me whenever the Lord is preparing a larger blessing for my ministry. The cloud is black before it breaks. The scouring of the vessel has fitted it for the master's use. Fasting gives an appetite for the banquet. The Lord is revealed in the backside of the desert while his servant keeps the sheep and waits in solitary. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, this psychologically frail man, published over 3,500 sermons, authored 135 books, and was regarded as the outstanding preacher of his generation. God is up to something when he sends difficulty into our life. You say, well, Pastor Jeremiah, suppose that isn't the way it happens for you. Suppose this disease continues to ravage your body and you are just here for a short time and you're on the glory. You know what? I win either way. (laughs) And in my life or in my death, whatever God designs, he will get glory and honor to his name if I keep my focus right, however tough that may be. Do you know there are a lot of pastors in this country who have gone through a lot worse than I have and are going through it right now? A lot of friends that I know who, if I mentioned their name, you would know them, but I want to tell you about one of them as we close today. Her name is Carol Carlson, and she wrote this. Listen carefully. Kent left the house that Thursday with a smile and a bear hug for his mom. At 18, life was great. 
He had graduated from high school with honors and had a good job working in a toy factory before starting college. The night before, he had gone to church and heard a message from two verses, all things work together for good and in everything give thanks. Kent was in a thankful mood, especially for the airplane he and his dad had just purchased. His dream was to become a missionary pilot and the future looked bright with promise. On Thursday night, he called home and he said, Mom, I'm just going out and practice a few touch and goes. Hold supper for me. I'll be home by nine. He never came home. In a clump of trees at the edge of a little country airport was the crashed plane and the bodies of Kent and his buddy Rick. One moment in time changed our lives. On that warm June night, God chose to take one of our precious children. How does a parent exist beyond that moment? Will the knots in our insides ever go away? In the weeks and months to follow, I learned more about God's love than I had in all my years of being a Christian. I learned that his word speaks to our needs. My grace is sufficient for you, and my strength is made perfect in weakness. When I felt helpless to do even the small tasks of the day, I would repeat, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When I saw a good-looking blonde kid on the street, I would remember that Kent had underlined in his Bible, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. When I began to indulge in self-pity, I would embrace my husband, Ward, who was suffering as intensely as I was. And remember, God said, encourage one another and build up one another. We were strengthened as we encouraged others. And his little brother didn't understand why his buddy didn't come home. And his big sister lost her pal and confidant. The friends in the youth group at church questioned God. And the kids at school asked why. The grace of God not only gave us comfort but also the urgency to reach out to others. Ward and I grew closer together as we went to other parents who had suffered a loss. We developed an uncommon boldness to reach out to those who were hurting. A greater tragedy than losing a child is not to know Jesus Christ personally. How grateful we are that our children, all of them, know and love him. Life has meaning when we have the assurance that we shall meet again. Carol Carlson. I'm not trying to tell you folks this life is easy, but I can tell you it's victorious. When you know Almighty God and His Son, Jesus Christ, you can go through whatever is put in front of you with a kind of power and strength that the world won't know anything about. And I'm telling you, if you don't know Christ, you're going into the battle without any gun. You're going into the battle with no armor. You're going into the battle in your own strength and you're going to fall on your face because God is the only one who can help you when trials come into your life. So I ask you today, do you know him? Have you met him through his son, Jesus Christ? Have you ever asked Christ to come into your life and confessed your sin and said, I'm going to live for God and give Jesus Christ my heart? That's the beginning place. You say, well, I'm not in any trouble right now, but that doesn't make any difference. You have to start where you are. And if God has spoken to your heart, I'm going to ask you to give your heart to him today while the Lord God is talking to you. Amen. If you ever needed the Lord, you need him when you're going through difficult times. He wants to be there for you. But first, you must confess your sin and ask him to come and be your savior and become a Christian. I hope you will do it today. It's a good day to do it. Hey, the weekend is about uh, to arrive, and I want to just encourage you to get to your church. If you haven't been going to church, you should start this weekend. Get back to church, back to your friends, back to the preacher, back to Sunday school classes and study groups, back to the place where you will find the strength you need to face whatever comes in the future. Church is very important, and this program is not a, a, a replacement for the church. It's an encouragement to go to church. We will be on television someplace in your community. You'll find us over the day. You can DVR us if we're at the wrong time for your church, but we hope you'll watch and be a part of the television ministry over the weekend. And then be sure to join us as we continue our journey through this incredible study of the Psalms. Next Monday, we're going to talk about how to have help for your life from Psalm 121. I hope you'll join us then. Have a great weekend, friends, and thanks for being a part of this great Bible study family.
The message you just heard originated from Shadow Mountain Community Church and senior pastor, Dr. David Jeremiah. Turning Point is also on radio and TV this weekend. To learn where to find it, visit our website, davidjeremiah.org slash radio. That's davidjeremiah.org slash radio. Or call 800-947-1993. Ask for your copy of David's book, Sleep on This, a nighttime devotional with biblical reflections to bring you peace and rest. It's yours for a gift of any amount. You can also purchase the Jeremiah Study Bible in the English Standard, New International, and New King James versions with notes and articles from Dr. Jeremiah's decades of study. Let us know how your faith is growing right to Turning Point, P.O. Box 3838, San Diego, California, 92163. This is David Michael Jeremiah. Join us Monday as we continue the series, When Your World Falls Apart, on Turning Point with Dr. David Jeremiah. Trials come in all shapes and sizes, from small interpersonal conflicts to massive global pandemics. Is there any way to make them easier to bear? Today on Turning Point, Dr. David Jeremiah suggests that you can radically change your view of trials by looking at them from God's perspective. From When Your World Falls Apart, here's David to introduce his message, Psalm for a Dark Night. Well, friends, there's an old statement that I read years ago that goes like this, never doubt in the darkness what God has revealed in the light. That's a really great principle. When Christians go through difficult times in their lives, they often forget whose they are and who God is. And the secret to surviving dark times, according to Psalm 71 and many other places in the Bible, is focusing on the light of God's truth. You see, darkness isn't a real commodity at all. It's just the absence of light. When light comes, darkness goes. Find the light of God's Word for your dark night. We're going to talk about that as we open our Bibles to the 71st Psalm. Hey, friends, we're going to the Caribbean, and we're going to leave on the 27th of December and return on the 7th of January. It's kind of our annual conference cruise at the end of a busy season. And this year, we'll be leaving on the 27th from Fort Lauderdale and visiting all kinds of great places. It's an 11-day cruise and features Michael Sanchez, Uriel Vega, and the Martins, who will be with us uh, for music. And the entire program is presented by Turning Point, and it will be a wonderful occasion for you to recover from the stress of the season and be blessed in your heart by music and the worship and by teaching from the Word of God and the unique fellowship that comes uh, when we get together with each other. For more information about the Caribbean cruise, let me encourage you to go to our website, which is davidjeremiah.org slash events. There's a beautiful brochure available. You can download it online or have it sent to you. But the Caribbean Conference Cruise is December the 27th through the 7th of January. It's a wonderful way to end the old year and begin the new with good friends, with the Word of God, with beautiful scenery, an incredible ship and with a wonderful time together. We hope you'll come and be with us. Find out about it at davidjeremiah.org slash events. We hope you'll join us. I have been thinking a lot about why God brings things into our lives and what he does in the process of it. And I want to tell you up front, I have got all the answers by any means, but you learn things in a dark night that you don't see in the daylight. And some of those things I want to talk to you about today. It was about 3 o'clock in the morning at the, the Green Hospital. And without going into all the details of what I was experiencing, I had uh, taken this treatment and I was on morphine. I've never been on morphine before. I don't recommend it. I was on a morphine drip, which means it was dripping into my system and it was going on all through the day and night. Well, morphine has different reactions with different people. And I would sleep for a little bit, and then I'd wake up, and I'd be just totally wide awake trying to figure out what was going on. Where was I? What was happening? It was during one of those nights when I was not sleeping. And I was, I guess, on that for about five days. I woke up, and I remembered that someone had given to me a scripture verse and said, Pastor, you need to read this. And I don't even remember now who it was. 
but it was an angel of God. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, not in my right mind, but being the best I could be at that moment, I pulled out my Bible and I began to read Psalm 71. And it was incredible to me what that Psalm did in my life. And I don't want to go into a lot of detail about my own personal experiences because this is really not about me. This is about God Almighty and what he can do in any one of our lives. And he has certainly trusted each of us with our own set of challenges. Even the best of God's people at one time or another are prone to ask questions when things happen they don't understand. And that is because of our humanity. Things do happen. How many of you know things happen? It was like that for a, a man that I read about who was a hard hat employee who'd had a really difficult accident and he was asked to fill out a report and he filled this report out to try to be helpful to his supervisors and this is what the report said when I got to the building where I was working I found that the hurricane had knocked off some of the bricks around the top of the building so I rigged up a beam with a pulley at the top of the building and hoisted up a couple of barrels full of bricks when I had fixed the damaged area there were a lot of bricks left over then I went to the bottom and began releasing the line. Unfortunately, the barrel of bricks was much heavier than I was. And before I knew what was happening, the barrel started coming down, jerking me up. I decided to hang on since I was too far off the ground by then to jump. And halfway up, I met the barrel of bricks coming down fast. I received a hard blow on my shoulder and then I continued to the top banging my head against the beam and getting my fingers pinched and jammed in the pulley. When the barrel hit the ground hard, it burst its bottom, allowing the bricks to spill out. I was now heavier than the barrel. So I started down again at high speed. Halfway down, I met the barrel coming up fast and I received severe injuries to my shins. When I hit the ground, I landed on the pile of spilled bricks, getting several painful cuts and deep bruises. At that point, I must have lost my presence of mind because I let go of my grip on the line. The barrel came down fast, giving me another blow on my head and putting me in the hospital. I respectfully request sick leave. <laughs> How many of you at one time or another for the way life beats up on you have requested sick leave to God? You know, I just want to drop out for a while and not be a part of what's happening. Well, the 71st Psalm certainly was penned by someone who was going through a similar experience. There is no superscription to Psalm 71. Often at the top of the Psalm, you can learn who wrote it. There is no superscription here because they're not really sure who did write it, but it is pretty evident to me that it was David and that it is a continuation of the thought process that you find in the 70th Psalm. And most scholars who have tried to pinpoint when this Psalm was written by David say it was during the time when his son Adonijah was trying to usurp the authority of the throne which David had promised to Solomon. So here was David in his old age his two boys, Absalom, who has already tried to take the throne, and Adonijah, who was trying to usurp Solomon's role. And David is going through some heartache. You talk about trouble with your kids. David could have expected it by the things that he did in his earlier life, but David paid a price that was heavy. And there's no pain that's like parental pain, and David was feeling it at the very core of his life. I guess it really doesn't matter too much who wrote the psalm because it's God's word and it's filled with truth that will help us no matter what our problems might be. One of the things I do know about the author is this. He was well acquainted with the word of God. For in the 24 verses of Psalm 71, there are over 50 quotations or allusions to other psalms. The psalm itself is simply a compilation of God's word. Over and over again, you see phrases that are from another psalm here, and, and the psalmist put it together in this most poetic form. So I want to talk with you for a little bit about the kinds of things that happen to us and how we are to respond and what we should do when they happen. First of all, I think it's important for us to take a visit to the reality of the trials in a believer's life. 
Sometimes people get the impression that if they're Christians, they should never have any trouble. That we should get a card that says, exempt from all suffering as soon as we accept the Lord. But there is no evidence that that has even been an afterthought in the Word of God. We are not exempt from suffering. We are human people. The different dimension is how we deal with it. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12, Beloved, don't think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing had happened to you. It's not strange. It's not unique. Everybody goes through difficulty, whether they're believers or not. And as the writer of Psalm 71 faced the pathway before him, he saw that it was suddenly a very steep hill to be climbed with many, many obstacles to be overcome. And he writes about it with a passion that only he could express. If we look through the psalm, we will begin to pick up some of the reasons that we have trials in our lives. For instance, sometimes we have trials because of ungodly foes. Notice verse 4 of chapter 71. Deliver me, O God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. David had some people who were his enemies, and they were creating stress for him. The word cruel there is a word from which the Old Testament gets the word leaven. It means he was wicked, and he was spreading his wickedness every way he could. It was fermenting. And it was ugly. Sometimes you have problems because of enemies. Maybe you have someone where you work or someone that you have to deal with in another company. Someone who knows perhaps that you're a Christian is decided out of their anger at God to make you the focal point. And so they do everything they can to make your life miserable. I know some Christians whose lives have been turned upside down because of another individual. It can happen and it can happen to you. Sometimes we have trials, says this psalmist, because of an uncertain future. Notice the ninth verse of the psalm where David speaks about getting old. In fact, I must tell you, when I first read this psalm, I thought it might have been a cruel joke on the part of whoever gave it to me because later on in the psalm, the psalmist says, Oh God, please don't forsake me when I am old and gray-headed. I sort of felt at the time I was reading that that I was both. But notice how he alludes to the fact that sometimes trials are a factor of our biological clock. He says, don't cast me off in the time of old age and don't forsake me when my strength fails. And sometimes there is a trial that comes to us because of sickness. You're going along and everything's fine and you never dream that you'll ever hear the word cancer related to your name, and then you hear it, and all of a sudden the reality settles in, and you realize that you didn't vote for it, you didn't get to ask about it, you didn't have anything to say about it, and it happened. And as you know, it's not a respecter of people. Sometimes people think, well, if you're a pastor, this shouldn't happen to you. Well, why not? I'm a people before I'm a pastor. <laughs> and things happen to people because of our humanity. He gives us another clue as to why we can have problems. In verses 10 through 13, sometimes it's because of unfaithful friends. Notice what he says in these verses. For my enemies speak against me, and those who lie in wait for my life take counsel together, saying, God has forsaken him. Pursue and take him, for there is none to deliver him. O oh God, do not be far from me. O oh my God, make haste to help me. Let them be confounded and consumed who are adversaries of my life. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor who seek my hurt. David has some people who are trying to subvert his authority. These are not foes. These are people from within his own circle. The folks who are trying to hurt him, if this is a part of Adonijah's rebellion, were not just enemies, they were the people of his own family, his own son. Absalom tried to take the throne away from David, and Adonijah tried to take the throne away from the son of David to whom he had promised it. He knew that his father was old, and so he rushed to try to work a power play against his own dad. Can you imagine how that must have hurt? Sometimes... People tell us of their family troubles and the trials that come because people who once were in love become bitter enemies one to another. 
The lawyers that I talk to tell me there is no more bitter scene in all the world than you see often in a divorce court where people who have been bound to each other by vows have now become bitter enemies and they come together in a court of law to destroy one another with hatred in their heart. And a person who has sensitivity toward God in any sense of the word cannot help but just die inwardly when that happens. Sometimes trials come because of unfaithful friends. But there's another thought here in this psalm, and I'm not taking this right now chronologically, but I'm just showing you the thoughts that God gave me in the psalm. Sometimes we have trials in our lives because of an unequaled father. Did you know that God's involved in our trials? He doesn't just know that they happen to us, friends. He allows them, and sometimes he even sends them. Did you know that? Just as a father who loves his children will allow his children to experience difficulties and try to work them through so they can grow in their knowledge and strength of how to deal with difficulties, God often sends difficulties into our lives to strengthen us and to make us better children in his family. And you surely see this in verses 19 and 20. Also your righteousness, O God, is very high. You who have done great things, O God, who is like you, you who have shown me great and severe troubles. God, you did it. He said, there's no God like you, but you've shown me great and severe troubles. And some of you could say, yeah, I, I'm in that class. He's done that to me. Say, why would God do that? Why would he let that happen? When troubles come and trials come into our lives and whether they're for these reasons or any other reasons, there are certain reactions that we have. Let's talk about the results of trials in the believer's life. How do we feel when that happens? Oh, we have many different feelings, and people have asked me over the years, when you found out you had cancer, were you afraid? Absolutely, totally afraid. Yes, I was. Afraid to die? No, but not anxious to do it either. <laughs> My fear was more the loss of my relationship for at least a period of time with the people that I love and all the kinds of things that go through your heart went through mine. But let me tell you what you feel when trials come into your life. David, or the author of this psalm, has certainly touched on numbers of them. First of all, sometimes you feel so totally vulnerable. There's a sense of vulnerability. You know, especially for those of us in the male gender who've had pretty much everything under control, you know? We've got it all figured out. We're going to have 40 more years to do the things we planned, and we're going to take care of our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren, and we've got it all scoped out. And then something happens that begins to cast doubt on the possibility of all that, and you feel so vulnerable. An interesting thing is that the seventh verse of the 71st Psalm says it this way, I have become as a wonder to many, but you are my strong refuge. What David meant was that everyone was watching him to see what he would do. If that's true for the average person, let me tell you, if you happen to be a Christian leader, it's really true for you. You feel a sense of great pressure and vulnerability. Notice what David did. He didn't know what he would do, but he was watching God to find out what God would do. That's what any of us does when we feel that sense of vulnerability. Then. When you go through trials, whether it's illness or any other kind of life-threatening thing that happens to you, you not only feel a sense of vulnerability, you feel a sense of insecurity. Notice in verse 2, David cries out, Deliver me in your righteousness and cause me to escape. Lord, I want out. Help me to get out of this mess. Let me wake up tomorrow morning and it won't be there. Verse 9, he says it the same way. He says, do not cast me away in the time of old age. Do not forsake me when my strength fails. One of the commentators that writes on this psalm, who I read, titled the psalm, Psalm for a Godly Old Man. <laughs> I like the godly part, the old man part, I'm not sure about. <laughs> but if it is true that this psalm was written to help those who are maturing in age, let me tell you, there is no need for those who are facing that like the need of security, is there? So often, the natural defenses that older people have against life's injuries are gone. They are retired from their employment. Sometimes their health is failing. 
Many of their friends are dying. Their minds are not as sharp as they used to be. Their income is greatly reduced, and they feel very defenseless and oftentimes very insecure. And the need for God is realized at a greater extent. And it's interesting to me that when David writes of the metaphors for God's help, he uses two main metaphors. One of them is in verse 3. It's called a strong refuge. He said, God, you're my strong refuge. <laughs> and the other's in verse 3, 2. He says, you are my rock and my fortress. When you're getting through with the growing old process and things aren't the way they used to be and you begin to not feel as strong and secure as you need someone to whom you can go who will be your fortress and your strong refuge who will be your rock and David said I found in God that he is that one for me <laughs> praise his name not only do you feel vulnerable and insecure but when you're going through problems you feel a sense of dependency you know one of the great characteristics of a strong leader before he knows God, and if he's not walking with God, one of the great characteristics is he is self-reliant. He is independent. He can make his own decisions and chart his own course and do his own thing. But sickness takes that away from you, and life-threatening things that come into your life begin to erode that sense of totally independent determination, and all of a sudden you begin to realize, this is something I don't have any control over. Lord, I don't know what to do with this. I've never faced this before, and I don't know what to do. Oh, God, if you don't break through for me big and strong, I'm in deep trouble. Lord, you're the only one. You say, well, I haven't been there yet, but I'll tell you what, your biological clock is ticking, and you will get there. All of us face that. We face the sense of vulnerability, insecurity, and dependency. And then sometimes along with this dependency, there's almost a feeling of panic or emergency. Notice in the 12th verse, David says, make haste to help me. Lord, please do it now. Lord, I know this could take a long time, but if you could, Lord, just wave your wand over this whole situation and make all the hurt go away. Make all the pain disappear. Take away whatever it is that they say is in my body that shouldn't be there. Lord, just make it be gone. Isn't that what we feel? What I love about the Psalms is they were written by a real person who faced trials just like we face, and he didn't try to put a spin on them. <laughs> he just told it like it was. Well, you say, Pastor Jeremiah, that's reality of trials and the result of trials in our life. What do we do with them? Someone has said the psalm is filled with great praise and great complaining all at once, and I don't know if that's true, but I know that after you get past David saying what it really was like in his own life, he takes the high road, and he shows us a direction. And I hope if you don't hear anything else I say, you kind of write down these few things because I believe these are critical to all of us. We don't have a theology of adversity in the church these days. We've got all of this prosperity gospel that's so permeated all of the stuff we do so that now we have positive this and positive that. And how many of you know that as much as you'd like it to be, life just isn't always positive? Sometimes the positive things get interrupted. I'd like it to be positive, but I'm a very positive thinker. But I'm going to tell you something. If you don't have a plan going into adversity, you won't do very well with it. Sooner or later, all of us face it of one kind or another. Unexpected, unannounced, uncharted, unplanned. What do you do? Well, let's follow through with David in his plan of operation. Notice, first of all, the response to his trials, he remembered the character of God. Notice again the first three verses. Notice what he said. In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my strong refuge to which I may resort continually. You have given the commandment to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Whenever we face our trials, we need to remember who God is. Sometimes we get so focused on our trials, we forget that. We need to go back as believers and focus on the character of God. It's interesting to me that as you take your pen and you go through this psalm and you mark it carefully, David filled his whole prayer here. His whole psalm is filled with references to the very character of God himself. 
And that's what really happens. You know, God shows up when we're in difficulty. He literally shows up in a way that you can almost touch him. I remember that. I remember feeling that it was almost worth going through what I did to sense and feel the closeness of God. I'm not saying it ever want to happen again. It was a very difficult time, as many of you know who've been through it. But God is there, and He always will be, no matter what you're facing. And He's with you now. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're experiencing, you may not see Him, you may not hear Him in your heart, but God is there. He's just waiting for you to reach out to Him through your prayers and through the Scripture. And He wants to show you Himself and show you what He can do in your life, even during dark days. So don't forget to do what David did. And friend, don't forget to join us tomorrow for part two of Psalm for a Dark Night from Psalm 71. Be sure to ask for your copy of the book, Sleep on This, our resource for the month of August. When you send your gift to Turning Point, simply say, please send me the Sleep on This book, and we will. And we'll see you tomorrow too, right here on this good station. For more information on Dr. Jeremiah's series, When Your World Falls Apart, please visit our website where you'll also find two free ways to help you stay connected, our monthly magazine, Turning Points, and our daily email devotional. Sign up today at davidjeremiah.org radio. That's davidjeremiah.org radio. Or call us at 800-947-1993. Ask for your copy of David's book, Sleep on This a nighttime devotional with biblical reflections to bring you peace and rest. It's yours for a gift of any amount. You can also purchase the Jeremiah Study Bible in the English Standard, New International, and New King James versions with notes and articles from Dr. Jeremiah's decades of study. Get all the details when you visit our website, davidjeremiah.org slash radio. This is David Michael Jeremiah. Join us tomorrow as we continue the series, When Your World Falls Apart, on Turning Point with Dr. David Jeremiah.